Let's see. Oh, hey, look at that. We're live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Uh, welcome back. We, we, uh, again, I just wanted to make sure that this conversation was going to be able to be saved and referenced in the future. Uh, we're, we're going to have a lot of great information, a lot of great history, but also to an appreciation of our guests time, uh, and, and knowledge, you know, I want to make sure that this was preserved. So thank you everybody for hanging in there. I see you guys returning into chat, coming back into the stream. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. And we are here with sun grown mids please say hello to everybody sir <laughs> hey how's it going future cannabis project uh always great to be on here chat good to see everyone uh mr toad awesome seeing you man loyalty you guys are great so great to be yeah. on thanks john I, I appreciate the invite and that you know yeah, I yeah. To come and share this time with you Oh man, it's absolutely my pleasure. I always get excited when I can give you a call and be like, "Ooh, I got something. Do you want to talk about this?" Yes. So, uh, we, you know, we got a really, we, we have a really good one tonight. Now, a lot of people to kind of frame the conversation, um, this year's Emerald cup, there were, uh, some enforcement officers, they were walking around, they were doing their thing. And I know you'll get to this. Um, but you, for some reason had, had a sparkly little bell over your head and they were like, well, let's talk to this guy. Wrong decision. Um, but so we, 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 we want to cover that. And a lot of people, you know, saw that because it's, it's impressive. Uh, it, it shouldn't be impressive, but it is impressive when a person knows their rights and they're able to kind of stand their ground in the face of adversity, because intimidation is a big factor with enforcement and policing, um, you know, regardless of whether you're, you know, a security guard at, at the, the football game or, you know, you're an actual in the streets law enforcement officer. Um, intimidation is a big part of it. And we saw a lot of the tactics in the conversation, such as separation enforcement by numbers uh, we saw all these things um but well eh, i'm sorry i keep saying we'll get to that but the reason why i say that is because this this goes so much further than just this recent example um there's been a lot of cases throughout history there's been a lot of people throughout history who have you know fought the good fight won some and lost more than they probably won but we wanted to go back and kind of cover some of those things just to set the stage for where we are today. And I see Peter in here. Yep, mall cops. Even the, even the mall cops, man, they they sneak up on you and your segues and oh brother. Um, but yeah, so we we wanted to get into that tonight, and I wanted you know to give Sungrown Mids the opportunity to lay out a little bit of the history because we need to understand this full picture. Once we understand this full picture, once we're confident in what we're saying, we'll be able to weather some pretty nasty storms. And uh, we got the captain of the ship right here with his bright yellow hat and the raincoat and those boots with the buckles on the front. So please, Sungrown Mids, uh, if that wasn't a long enough introduction for you, I could probably go another five minutes. But uh, no, please, let's let's give a talk and about legalization and about <clears throat> patients' rights and why that's been an important area of study for you. Um, yeah, so... Thank you for the intro. And yes, <laughs> there's what happened at the Emerald Cup um, is kind of it's a microcosm of how this the evolution of the whole medical thing has happened. And really, it's it's how medical gets dealt with once we enter into this new world of legalization, which is really regulation. It's a regulatory market and that's all they're focused on is creating and implementing a highly controlled regulatory market and that system and the medical system are just they're at odds with each other and so we saw it in washington you know you washington is kind of the the cautionary tale of what can happen once legalization sort of or rec regulation takes over um, the medical scene. And so I feel like in California, 
you know, every place is unique and different, but we have rights still. And Prop 64 didn't erase the history of 215. It didn't erase the rights. It didn't erase the case law. And we need to, you know, stand up for those rights. And even though they've kind of been curtailed in a lot of ways and limited through Prop 64 and other legislation that has been adopted over the years and case law, those rights still exist and we need to know what they are and exercise them. And you're absolutely right. Policing operates primarily through intimidation. Um, drug dogs aren't actually that effective. Um, they're just an intimidation tactic. Uh, the actual requirements for drug dogs are that they have to stay 18 inches outside of your vehicle and that they can't go inside of your vehicle at all. I've been stopped in the past and had drug dogs during the little like search and see, or you know, they're, whatever they're doing, you're not technically doing a search and seizure. They're trying to establish probable cause to do that. But when they do that, they'll literally let the dog jump into your vehicle. And if that's on the dashboard cam and you can show and prove in your case that the dog reached the 18 inch window of the private space around your car, um, that that's a violation and an illegal search and seizure. And it's not real probable cause when they do that. And so there are tons of restrictions on dogs. Um, and they're just there to scare you and to make you say, yeah, I got drugs. Here are my drugs. That's the whole point of it. Um, and the DCC, um, which is the Department of Cannabis Control in California, um, they they have a cop mentality. And that's what we saw at the Emerald Cup. Uh, you're muted, Chad. I'm famous for that. Damn. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Um, but no, that, that is absolutely intimidating. Um, you know, some people think having a, a yelling person 12 inches from their face is intimidating. Have a snarling dog with big teeth trying to, you know, get at you. And it's it's funny to me in in my head as you're saying this example we've all watched you know cops and all this stuff and you know we've seen how they use the dogs and and you're right it is kind of how you described but that's not the legal procedural way of handling that and unless you know that which is such a simple thing unless you know that you might be going to jail that night mm -hmm. so god even even the littlest of things like that i know i got off one time because they found a container um, on me and they opened it and they found what they wanted in there. And I'm like, you didn't have any right or probable cause to open that, did you? And it was a, it was a conversation. They kept it. I went on my way that night. So little procedural thing. So that was so important. Thank you for mentioning that right off the top. That's a gold nugget to start with because yeah, when when they bring the dogs in, they'll push the limit man again they're not expecting you to know their procedures they're not expecting you to know your rights so they'll do give an inch take a mile yeah yeah and um comfortably numb said in here uh when you're asked uh you admitted you don't have probable cause or a right to detain me uh that's like absolutely immediately as soon as you're interacting with a cop you definitely want to refuse any search and right. ask whether or not you're being detained and whether or not you're free to go. And if you're being detained, then there are certain requirements and like you want to make sure that you hold them to procedure and that you affirmatively express that you are not consenting to a search. Um, I also had a friend once who uh refused to consent to a search from a cop he had some herb on him and um the cop asked him to get out of the car and he said no and then the cop grabbed him and pulled him out of the car uh you have to listen to a direct order from a peace officer but you can do so by like under protest essentially mm -hmm. and it's important that you do so under protest so 
you, in his instance, he needed to comply with the peace officer, get out of the vehicle and say, I don't consent to you searching me. Am I being detained or am I free to go? If I'm being detained, I want a lawyer. And immediately initiate your rights from the like point of contact, not the, oh, we went through a whole bunch of stuff. You got my, you searched me. You now have evidence against me. You're arresting and booking me. And now I'm going to assert my right to a lawyer. You want to assert all of these rights early and often and make sure that you're explicitly expressing that you don't consent to anything, even though you're doing it. Um, Cause that, that refusal to grant consent is a big deal. And mm-hmm. they, they will totally use and like, they will try to make it seem as though you have consented to whatever the fuck they've done, even if it's right. just an acquiescence to what they're doing. Yeah, that's very, very important. Cause again, that will come up and that those, those little details of permission or doing it under protest in a judge's eyes makes a big legal difference. Um, it's hard for people to take that position up front though, because a lot of times we're, you know, taught just don't be confrontational, uh, just answer the questions, they'll send you on your way. So what do you think is, is a good approach to saying, you know, Hey, I get you're doing your job, but no, you can't do that. I'm not going to let you do that. What, what, what is a good approach to maybe, uh, throw out in the face of something like that where you know you have to do this uh you really don't have a choice but you can do it under protest um you typically you just want to make it clear that i don't consent to any search and seizure and that you don't that if you're being detained you want a lawyer that's those two things are the main things other than that if you're in like some protracted argument or debate with a enforcement officer. One, if you're operating under medical, it's have a recommendation on you, have some Mm. form of documentation that's current and up to date. Two, if you're operating under like a rec sort of scenario, then, you know, you definitely need to conform to the laws and regulations, however onerous they may be. Like in California, you're not allowed to have cannabis, open cannabis inside of your like car. You can have it in the trunk. And so like those are things that you have to kind of like be mindful of. Um, a lot of times I've found that with law enforcement in the state of California, it was a lot easier to have these discussions than um any, obviously anywhere else, like, you know, <laughs> Wyoming it was not a productive discussion, but, uh, in California, I usually, what would happen is if I had issues, I would tell them I had a recommendation and either they would let me go on my way or they would do a sobriety check because at a certain point in California, sobriety checks became one of the primary mechanisms for them to enforce some form of like drug laws on legit recommendations. Um, So they claim to smell cannabis in the vehicle, pull you out and have you do a sobriety test. And if you could pass the sobriety test, you'd go along your way, but they try and usually confiscate whatever you had. In Calaveras County, they would try and confiscate people's recommendations, and they actually had a few cases where they stole patients' identities and had legitimate, valid recommendations that the sheriff's department used to then purchase cannabis from delivery services and try and entrap and set them up. And that created a whole set of court cases locally. And um, I hope yeah. so. I hope yeah. so. That's fraud. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. not to mention entrapment that. but yeah yeah and it was done the guy that the local deputy who had done it had just come back from a dea training so it was like <sighs> he went to a dea training and they were like this is this is one of the ways in which you can like screw them up because what they kept on having a problem with when they were trying to set up different delivery services or uh, brick and mortar dispensaries was they would go in and they'd try and make 
false purchases. And mm -hmm. most of the time it would fail because they didn't have a legit recommendation. Whereas when they had a legit recommendation okay. and they called the doctor and said, hey, is this person on this recommendation, you know, yep. legit? And then the delivery person who, you know, typically is a, you know, an entry level sort of employee person right. who's just making the handoff doesn't do the check of the ID to the recommendation thoroughly and then makes the transaction. And that's how they would bust people. And like, they went around and did that in a bunch of different municipalities and tried to, you know, do phony purchases. And that's like, that's been a huge, a large part of the enforcement became focused on, you know, figuring out ways to entrap people and to trick people into, um, into something, into a charge that could show that they were doing something other than medical. Right. And that's, you know, it's almost kind of a, a checks and balances that, you know, the system is working, that these businesses are doing, you know, what they should be doing. If they're really checking your recommendations and finding out, yeah, no, this doesn't connect back to a docker. It's a, uh, you know, it's Art Vandalay's architecture office. Um, it's a one on one doesn't add up. So that is kind of shysty that they they did that. But I, you know, I know a lot of times especially you said he you know he went to the big boys meeting is with the dea and there's you know i mean come on guys it, it's kind of like us in a way sometimes we're like well you know you can never do that but some people have done this there's a lot of that going on there you know it's just that indirect uh indirect way of saying go for it shooter um but yeah i mean the stings are a real thing when i was working at the dispensary up here they the lcb sent in an underage kid and that was my job to make sure no <laughs> underage people got through so i you know i turned them away i kind of looked at the id and i was just like ah, you know i'm sorry man i think it's bullshit you can't be in here but you can't be in here so sorry and yeah he got out walked down the half a block got in the cop car and drove away and one of our regulars came back in and was like dude did you let him in I'm like no i turned him away he's like good and then we went back and watched the security footage from outside uh, you know heart attack a little bit but these types of things show that businesses are trying to do the right thing. We are trying to play by the rules that you put out. Quit trying to, you know, like trip us up in these shitey ways. So, yeah. That's yeah. a little scandalous. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so the history goes back way back and we can get into some of it. So like, yeah, yeah. Um, the history of medical is crazy. Uh, it's a really interesting story if you go all the way back. Um, California's interesting, but it goes even further than what happened in California. It really rests with a guy named Robert Randall. And Robert Randall had glaucoma, and he got busted in Washington, D.C. for growing cannabis in his like on his front porch in his backyard. And um, his defense was that it was for medical necessity because he, um, he had glaucoma and was, it was degenerative and it was continually getting worse and inevitably he was going to go blind. So he um, started growing cannabis, found that it was helpful and that it was reducing the pressure in his eyes and the uh, effects or uh, symptoms of glaucoma. And so he was doing this. His lawyers ended up bringing a necessity defense. And this is old common law where if you have a necessity and there are three different tests that they apply to this, you can demonstrate that because of whatever necessity that compelled you to do the thing that you did violating the law, it's okay because that necessity outweighs the interest of, you know, the prohibition or the law itself. And this was a really landmark case because the judge who heard the case was a judge named James A. Washington. And he really took it seriously. And it happened at a time where the CSA Controlled Substance Act had been passed in 1970. It had replaced the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act and other laws 
involving controlled substances and had created the DEA or like led to the creation of the DEA. And part of the Controlled Substance Act was that it was supposed to do this study to assess whether or not uh, cannabis should stay as a Schedule One. They did the study, they, it was the Schaefer Report, it showed that cannabis shouldn't stay as a Schedule One, but they kept it as a Schedule One anyways. Uh, Judge Washington looked at this, he looked at a lot of the literature and basically determined like, no, this is, this is bullshit. There's like real legitimate medical reasons for why you can use cannabis and it shouldn't be Schedule One. And he did the, the legal analysis for how you would assess a necessity defense and determined that Robert Randall's interest in not going blind outweighed the interest of the federal government and the state government to, pro, to enforce prohibition. And that case, in a circuitous way, ended up Essentially, that's what Prop 215 was. Prop 215 ended up enshrining in law the ability to bring a medical necessity defense in state court in California. So if you are a qualified patient in the state of California, you can bring a medical necessity defense. And there were some people who were already doing that successfully in the early 90s prior to Prop 215 getting passed. Um, it just wasn't uniform. There wasn't, you know, like sometimes if you had a receptive judge or a receptive jury and the arguments got made, you may be able to win it. But otherwise, a lot of times it would just get rejected. And um, so that was the impetus initially for it. Um, Robert Randall then ended up suing the federal government, and that led to the creation of the federal government's medical marijuana program that they admi uh, administered for the last 30 plus years, 40 plus years now. And um, so he then, after that, he formed a couple of other, a number of other groups. Um, one was called ACT. Um, they mostly focused on cannabis research and giving people cannabis therapies. Um, in the early 90s, he formed a group that was focused specifically on AIDS research and getting AIDS patients because this is going to be a huge part of the whole story of medical marijuana and what happened in California is the AIDS epidemic broke out in the 80s. And when the AIDS epidemic broke out, it largely went ignored by the Reagan administration. Um, San Francisco obviously was a epicenter and it was particularly bad in the gay community in San Francisco. And because of this, there was a lot of stigmatization and blaming of the community themselves and failure on the part of the Reagan administration to actually do anything about it for an entire decade. And ACT UP was an organization. They were, ACT UP was an AIDS uh, activist organization that really sort of started organizing around getting alternative and experimental therapies to AIDS patients in the 80s. Um, they, and by they, I mean everybody who was involved in this larger effort of getting alternative therapies authorized for AIDS patients in the late 80s and early 90s started inundating the IND program. The IND program was the experimental cannabis program that got created as a result of Randall, uh, Robert Randall's case. So they inundated that program with requests for AIDS patients. And in 1991, George H.W. Bush shut it down and eliminated the program and blocked all of these people from gaining access. Um, around the same time, Dennis Perone in San Francisco, um, he was a longtime activist from the 70s. He had been doing activism and selling cannabis uh, in storefronts and different apartments in the Castro uh, a neighborhood in San Francisco. Compassion clubs. Yes, yes. yes. And he, um, 
he had been raided multiple times. Uh, he was very close with Harvey Milk. And San Francisco is, everybody knows it to be like a bastion for left liberal leaning sort of radicalism, particularly in the 60s, 70s. Oh, yeah. um, uh, there was also an insanely, rapidly racist, homophobic, and nasty police force. The oh, yes. SFPD was notorious. Um, in a raid on Dennis's place, he ended up getting shot, and the officer that shot him in the trial on the on the witness stand said something to the effect that he was only like. His only regret was that he didn't kill him because then there would be one less faggot on, in San Francisco. That was literally what the guy said on the stand. Yeah. And, um, wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, like, out of those trials, and also Dennis's partner dying of AIDS right in this same time period, Dennis committed himself to the medical marijuana movement 100 percent literally like dedicated himself to like this is the thing we're going to do and spent the next really from 92 to 96 just full bore focused on that effort and um dennis uh brownie mary um uh, a lot of people in san francisco are kind of like one nexus of like activists and people, grassroots organizers who were involved on the ground and had been doing this stuff since, you know, the counterculture emerged and since the seventies and stuff, since they came back from Vietnam and therefore were protesting Vietnam. That was uh, a big, case, maybe. yeah, that seems to be like a big impetus for a lot of people to get into the, the kind of legalization movement. I know uh, like he's Stroop, or Strope, uh, the person who found it, found it normal. Uh, yeah. That was a big impetus for him. Uh, he was, and he was actually, he was working in the government at that time. He was one of the Nader's Raiders um, yeah. Yeah. working on um, like kind of a public safety commission. Uh, and he realized that there was no group that was lobbying for the cannabis legalization. And he, you know, as a lawyer kind of saw people get caught up into it. So he was one of the people, um, and then California too. When I, when I hear Dennis Perone, I, my mind automatically goes to Eddie Lepp. Um, because I know that those two kind of had a, a special kind of relationship and they helped each other out, particularly in that time of two fifteen. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah those, and those are both names. Vietnam vets. And like, yep. that's something that so many People came back from Vietnam and, uh, yeah, like, our, it, it's really incredible just the number of, there's been some in, interesting comments on the recent uh, Brotherhood of Eternal Love post that I made. Mm. Um, but, like, a lot of these different things, be it the Vietnam War and sending a bunch of young conscripting and sending a bunch of young people around the world to go fight in the bullshit war, which a lot of them then realize and come to the conclusion this is completely fucked up, while being in Southeast Asia with access to local cannabis are then like, and a counterculture emerging and like opposition to the war emerging here in the States, like, this decision ends up creating a massive blowback and fracturing our society in really intense ways that last for a long time because a lot of the people who come back come back and they're in a lot of different ways fucked over by society on all different fronts and then kind of go out into the hills and start growing cannabis and i mean there was crazy shit that went down like the um in the 80s when they shot down the camp helicopters up mm -hmm. in Humboldt. Those were Vietnam vets. Like, when they started sending in helicopters into the woods where a bunch of people who had just come back from Vietnam were out there doing, you know, primer shit. Like, yeah, yeah it was not only, like, it was intimidating and threatening and traumatizing, no doubt, for a bunch of people who had PTSD who had just come back from the war. And our society wasn't, like, equipped to deal with the shit that it created in that context. And it was then left 
to us, and by us, I mean the Dennis Perones, the Eddie Lepps, the people who then built something out of that fucked up craziness and really, you know, like those people who were part of that generation and came like on both sides, the soldiers who ended up having to fight in that shit, the anti-war protesters who opposed that shit, like then really in a, a very real way are part of the whole context that creates 215 and the cannabis world that we know, the Emerald Triangle, all these different things. And it's, it's interesting just how there's the convergence of all these different factors that produce these outcomes. You've got the countercultural element, but then you've also got like this interesting military element and veterans coming back from a war. Um, and then you've got the AIDS epidemic and how that impacted a particular community that was being marginalized and excluded from society and how they had to come together and figure out ways to deal with an epidemic of like the AIDS epidemic in the eighties was just devastating. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of different people coming together and figuring out how to create forms of mutual aid and community that really gave birth to the cannabis movement and 215 in particular. And another group of people, and this is somewhat ironic given uh, some posts I did not expect to be making in the last 24 hours, but um, we... I, I, <laughs> I was about to mention that. Yeah. Um, the Cannabis Action Network, uh, Debbie Goldsberry, um, Jeff Jones, uh, Steve D'Angelo, like, yeah, dude was fully, like, he was there. He was involved in the Cannabis Action Network back in the 80s, prior to when they moved out to California. So he's got his stripes, not any shade I throw at Steve, if you've seen my post yeah. on IG, like, yeah. it's yeah. shade for present deeds not past deeds the guy definitely was there early on he helped um the hemp industry and the medical uh marijuana industry or cannabis whatever and from how i've kind of heard it described um by a few people um and this is actually from key Stroop, is he he was part of the yippies uh the yippies go back to like the countercultural the 60 70 movement um kyle cushman was a yippie you know keith stroop was there you got the founder of high times he was there a lot of these people were in the same orbit it was that kind of countercultural um protest but pro cannabis movement that a lot of these people met and came out of it, it, it's kind of you know, it's weird. Like me, I've, I've been doing music my whole life and, and some of the people that, you know, I just grew up with and we started together, they're doing like huge, big stuff. But to me, they're still the same people that, you know, we were playing in the garage together. And and that's kind of the same way with a lot of these yippies. You know, they, they kind of started out at that grassroots level. And I mean, you look at like the Steve D'Angelo's and the, you know, the owner of or the former owner of High Times and all these people. And, they, and they've, you know, they've definitely made it out. So, yeah, they... They, they came from a, uh, um, an era and a, and a place, but they did kind of go separate ways and take separate paths, uh, kind of like you were mentioning there um, with some of those other people. And I'm sorry to sidetrack because I forgot why I got on that tangent other than just I know a lot of them had the common connections years ago. Now we see them kind of playing out. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so Cannabis Action Network was... Uh, for context, um, it was a group that formed in the late 80s, and they they went around uh, on tour, basically, on following different uh, bands or, like, it was back when, I can't remember all the names, but there was, like, in the early 90s, mid-90s, there was a lot of those, like, uh, Lollapalooza and shit like that. Like yeah. there were sort of like mainstreamish like music festivals that would tour all around the country, and so they went on tour like that kind of like the Dead tour had been back in the day, but they were doing it to target a young demographic and to 
basically mobilize people politically around cannabis as a political issue. And they did this for 89, 90, and then they moved out west. And they had also spent some time in like Kentucky. And I think Steve D'Angelo had like put him up in a place in Kentucky at that time. I know Steve also was heavily involved in um, hemp clothing back in the day. And so basically Cannabis Action Network was a group of dedicated activists who were committed to mobilizing young people around this issue across the country and um, getting both hemp and medical as kind of like the two primary focuses for legalization efforts. Um, they moved out west, they participated in a lot of the early organizing. Um, Jeff Jones was uh, the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Club eventually is what he opened up. And Debbie Goldsberry has been involved in a number of different operations. I know she was involved in Magnolia, um, a dispensary out of Oakland. And so point being, that was another group of people that were largely focused more on the East Bay. Um, so there's kind of like the San Francisco contingent, the East Bay contingent. There's also another the Santa Cruz contingent with Wham and Valerie Carroll. Coral. Hmm. Sorry, I, I suck with names. I forget names all the time. And I see. apologize to everyone whose name I've ever butchered on here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so there was like another contingent there. Obviously, the Emerald Triangle had its, like, you know, it, it was the densest group and populace of growers in the state of California. So they had a, a decent contingent up there. And between those, like, initial groups of individuals that sort of formed the, like, the grassroots core for mobilizing around 215 and really... Uh, many 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 years long effort this was not a you know 1996 prop 215 on the ballot we're gonna vote for it this was not sean fucking parker showing up in 2016 okay this and sean sean parker for everybody he was the facebook executive yeah that tried to uh, buy the legalization in his uh, effort yeah yeah or his favor okay yes totally and succeeded with prop 64 um so a lot of work a lot of hard efforts going into this um grassroots sort of coordinated effort crafts frames starts the push for 215. after it had started going at some point um a number of angel donors kind of decided to help out the um signature gathering process and that was George Soros. Yes, wow. at George Soros. Gave a lot of money to the Prop 215 campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what's his... Uh, you're going to like the way you look. Uh, the suits guy. Men's Warehouse. Yeah. Uh, George Zimmer. Yeah. He, um, his mom wouldn't smoke cannabis because it was illegal. And so... Like, she passed away in pain, and he, because of this, basically committed himself to trying to get medical marijuana passed and, or cannabis. Um, so that's how, like, his entry into cannabis philanthropy. And there were, I think, Peter Lewis or somebody else, some other large philanthropist figure who has lots of billions of dollars, gave lots of money. But they only did so after the work had been done by a lot of other people. And really it was kind of, it was for signature gathering at the last hour, just to make sure that the requisite number of signatures were gathered, but they had already done a lot of the signature gathering and all like the grassroots sort of like work. And I know like, many many of my mom's friends were all involved in it we weren't living in california at the time in 96 but um 
pretty much every one of her friends was a signature gatherer because like if you were like in the scene at that time and were at all involved like signature gather that was the thing that everybody was doing in 95 96 time period trying to get that thing qualified for the ballot and um they did they got it qualified and it passed and the crazy thing about prop 215 was that all it did was create an affirmative defense it it, it was it's an, a very nebulous thing it gives you the right to have your day in court and defend yourself that's what it allows you to do and so so many people who are going into court were going in and they were trying to use robert randall's medical necessity defense and it was a crapshoot it was totally a whim as to whether and usually more often than not you were, you were more likely to lose than to win using a medical necessity. After 215, that changed damn near everything. And it really impacted the, like, the decision-making calculus of law enforcement. Prosecutors stopped. Like, I mean, I'll, I can just say about Calaveras where like, I know. Um, one of the first cases was brought against a guy named Robert uh Columbus. um we all called him island he uh yeah <laughs> um, he grew a large like i think he had 300 plants um he got busted and it was this was just like nursery stock honestly this wasn't even like they weren't flowering they just like he had a large nursery set up and they they saw it and did surveillance and busted him on it. Tony Sarah ended up representing him. He ended up losing and um, his medical defense, like, he basically tried to say that he was a caregiver for the OCBC and they were not really, like, it was early days still and the whole caregiver and whether or not you could, as a grower, claim the medical necessity defense if you're growing for somebody else um, was unclear. But the main upshot of that case was that he ended up getting sentenced to, I think, nine months after it got challenged. He got um, community service. His community service was working in the community garden at the local city <laughs> company. So, like, awesome. he was kicking it with his homies at a like hippie commune doing shit he'd be doing otherwise um then after that the next person and i was there when he got raided was bear dyken he in 99 they flew his patch came in raided him and then essentially the plea bargain that they ended up giving him was that he use alter or find some form of alternative therapy in addition to cannabis because they couldn't tell him that he couldn't smoke cannabis at that point so the alternative therapy that he was sentenced to by the his plea deal was massage therapy so after like one dude got sentenced to gardening and another dude got sentenced <laughs> to massage therapy oh. like they would fuck with you and like it wasn't cool like the sheriff uh, Dennis Downham is a unique shithead in the history of shitheads, and it was still unpleasant to be out there. But the prosecutors weren't going to take anything to trial because it was like, what the fuck? What are we going to do here? And then later on, when the a couple about ten years later, um, when the entrapment thing happened, then it was just a massive clusterfuck that blows up in their face, where like the local deputy is stealing patients' identities to then entrap delivery services. And so it's like in Calaveras County, it just became a fuck up after fuck up after fuck up, making it so that local enforcement officers, like even if a cop would fuck with you and take your shit, you could get a lawyer who would literally for $50 call the DA and say, 
hey, how how are we going to handle this thing or whatever the I don't know what the fuck we said, but like right. it was done. It was literally like you would not be charged. There would be nothing. It would be done and you'd go about your time. And it really came down to whether or not they felt like you were weak enough to mm -hmm. like fuck with. That was really the thing that happened there. And Outsiders. I mean, Calaveras was a fucking... Like I said, Dennis Downing was a piece of shit. But, uh, like, the what 215 did was it created a, a different calculus for how they were going to fuck with us. They could no longer just fuck with us and be like, ha, 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 hippie, we're going to throw you in jail. It was like, fuck, now this is just a big waste of everybody's time and they're laughing at us getting high while we're punishing them. Right. Well, a lot of it, you know, I mean, it's, it's the total shakedown, too, because there was the disconnect between the prosecution arm and the enforcement arm. Uh, prosecution, um, you know, the penal system, they're, they're a little bit overloaded with these things. They're like, we, we have other priorities. Uh, but a lot of enforcement agencies uh, derive their budget from busts and proceeds. Um, I know that's changed in some states, the, the civil asset forfeiture law, but I know uh, like Operation Green Merchant that went down, that was really how they ruined a lot of people. They, you know, they took their business, they took their merchandise, they didn't put them in jail, but they took everything under, under that civil forfeiture law. And again, that money goes kind of straight back to the budget of these departments. So I imagine that came into play in, in the scenario that you're mentioning. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And that's honestly kind of something that we're seeing now in the transition. Um, it, it kind of brings us up to date to what happened at the Emerald Cup. Because, um, and just more broadly, what's happening across the state of California. Um, so criminal prosecution in an instance or a scenario where you have like large forfeiture potential is a potential revenue stream. And that's definitely something that's happened and is real and is fucked up. Um, busting weed like grows is not particularly lucrative, um, particularly on like a lot of the illegal grows are they're not on properties that are well maintained or necessarily valuable. Right. And I mean, Calaveras land, relatively speaking, is not as valuable as other parts of the state. Um, mm -hmm. It's a poor sort of portion of the, uh, the state. But um, there's what they're doing now, and they tried to do this in Calaveras. We were able to stop them. Um, but Really, there's an effort to use code enforcement or civil penalties against people for growing. And like the DCC lady that I was interacting with or the, the cops at the Emerald uh, Cup Ball, Harvest Ball, those people were not cops. They have no criminal jurisdiction. Like they don't get to arrest me and charge me with crimes. They get to oversee, like, cookies and the people who are licensed operators who are operating in that system, not me, who's just a person who has weed on me. If I have too much cannabis on me and they see that, they can go over to the cop and tell the cop, hey, cop, that guy's breaking the law. He has more than an ounce of cannabis. Go do something. They have no ability to do anything to me like they could only go to the emerald cup and be like you've got a person with too much cannabis do something or you know licensee you sold too much cannabis to this person which can happen obviously but it's like that's what they have jurisdiction over so were they there just kind of by default like it was a cannabis event, kind of like any music event. You have to have a certain amount of EMT. You have to have a certain amount of security and off-duty police officers. Um, they don't have to be there. 
they don't have to be there. They're just they they woke up and said, you know what, today let's fuck so with some they, stoners. They don't have to be there, but they don't like. There's nothing in the regulations or the rules that require on-site okay. DCC presence and enforcement. Okay. Um, but they have full like legitimate access, and there's no like blocking them. So anybody. Mm -hmm. Like some people were kind of like, why did the Emerald Cup allow them on there? The Emerald Cup as a licensed operator in the state of California cannot say whether or not they can come on. They have right. a right of access that's written into the rules. Um, they don't have any authority over individuals who aren't licensees. They have authority over licensed premises. So the Emerald Cup's event they had authority over that and they had authority over the different individual licensees within the event the attendees at the event they don't have any authority over and at most they could be like hey get this asshole out of here to right. the emerald cup like that's or hey cops come deal with this crime or some shit. um but the way this plays out in local municipalities is that Santa Cruz is one of the worst. Um, they've adopted incredibly punitive and massive fine systems hmm. that just increase and increase and increase. And um, like I think uh, I can't can a little hazy on the details, but I'm pretty sure I heard a trimmer got hit with a tens of thousands of dollar fine. A trimmer, just a trimmer at a is illegal grow is yeah. this based off of code violations or yeah. actual yeah. okay so it's not like it's still cannabis related but it's almost like you know the irs going after al capone they got him on tax evasion you know exactly so okay. instead of going after people criminally because if they go after you criminally you still have 215 rights and this 215 rights in the world of prop 64 have not been clearly delineated and established in case law. And so there is, there's a lot of language and a lot of rights that have been brought over. For instance, if you're a qualified patient, all of that, and you can prove that you're a qualified patient and they wanna fuck with you and take shit to criminal proceedings, all of the case law that exists is there. So the Trippet case, the Trippet case yep. is an important one. Pebbles Trippet was somebody who got busted prior to Prop 215 passing. She had two pounds in her car. Um, and she used to get busted with, like, pounds all the time. There's, like, I think she got busted, like, 11 times over 10 years with fucking wow. pounds every fucking time. And she was <laughs> just going hard, like, trying. She was actively trying to create a test case and to... Invoke succeeded. her constitutional rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she made a medical necessity defense argument at trial. It was rejected. She made a religious uh, defense. It was rejected. And she got convicted for having, you know, two pounds on her. 215 passed like four days later. And so she appealed and got 215 to apply retroactively to her case. Wow. And then essentially that language that something about an implicit right to have the amount of cannabis necessary uh, according to the patient's needs determined by the doctor. So like that precedent right there saying that <clears throat> You can have as much cannabis on you as determined by your needs, as determined by your doctor, made it so that people were able to carry more than, for instance, myself at the Emerald Cup, more than an ounce. And that's in the law. Like, if you look at um, some of the uh, uh, statutes that I posted, Health and Safety Code 1130. Uh, I think it's 11 to 37.7, some shit like that. Um, it specifically states that you can have up to eight ounces if you're a qualified patient or 
as much as you need if stated by your doctor if that's insufficient for uh, the patient's needs. So what she was able to do was establish that as a precedent for people to move around outside of their houses with cannabis. A later precedent was the Wright case that also further established this. Um, that was more in the context as like, she was just rolling deep with like two pounds and was <laughs> like, I get to roll with two pounds. Um, uh, the Wright case was more like, I get to roll with pounds to a dispensary and establish that transportation right that like you get to drive with cannabis to a dispensary that's changed a little bit now because uh fucking um transportation licenses and stuff right so, we've we we've regulated that here that's always yeah. the thing that struck me it's interesting about amsterdam is it's not legal until it hits the doorstep of the coffee shop and then it's legal <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so um, that thing, like, you can still drive around with, based on the TripIt um, decision on as much cannabis as is established as your medical need by your doctor, um, which can be in excess of eight ounces. Otherwise, if you're just a qualified patient that doesn't have uh, an additional requirement, you can... You can travel anywhere with eight ounces of cannabis. And the way they defined it is totally fucked. And I think you could, like, you could drive a truck through that one. <laughs> um, like, could you have eight ounces of concentrate? Uh, well, so or they define it... it as mature, dried, processed flour. So if and it's wet and untrimmed, you're fine, right? Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> this creates some, like, the fact that they used four words to characterize something that is otherwise defined in the, <laughs> so, bills and fucking government speak is a maze and a nightmare, but um, you got to read the definition section. And any words that are defined up there have a specific meaning that is there anything else that doesn't have a definition that's there but is throughout the rest of the text then has the plain implicit meaning and by having one definition for dried flour and then having a phrase that they use which is not that phrase fucks them up in my bullshit sort of like i'm not a lawyer but like just looking at that the fact that my shit was not processed like it was like branches like this long um like untrimmed like right. not trimmed at all that's not processed cannabis based on if you go on the dried flour and what processed dried flour is according to the statute is something different than what I have. And if you were to look at any processed dried flour based on the statute, it doesn't look like untrimmed fucking turkey bags of hippie weed. Like that's, these things are clearly different. And so on one level, you can just like the eight ounces gives you eight ounces. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the case law decides that unprocessed or wet or those sort of like qualifiers modify the amount that you can possess and transport not yeah. has not been determined by the case law and still needs to be determined and the way that we do that is by one rolling with our you know it, maintain a, a recommendation maintain your status as a qualified patient it's a little wanky or like wonky there in terms of like you i'm a qualified patient just on the fact that i have had this conversation with my doctor it doesn't need to be an actual physical recommendation in a piece of paper um based on the case law okay. now that's only going to help you in court once right. you've like, gone into <laughs> that look round just in just being like hey i'm a guy i i got like i can have lots of cannabis 
because I can, because I talked to my doctor, won't be persuasive. But if you go to court and you can actually prove that, yeah, I did have this conversation with my doctor and my doctor did say to continue using it as a potential therapy, then you're totally in the clear, even without a recommendation that has been written out or paid for in the last year. Um, and I, I can find the actual case law, but Omar Figueroa and Pebbles Trippett did mm -hmm. a really good article um, for O'Shaughnessy's journal, beyondthc.com. Um, but they like go through a bunch of these different cases, and this is one of them that they highlight. Um, is but yeah, so... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no continue. No, no. Oh, I was... Yeah. I was just going to ask if this was a, a federal case law that you're referencing or if this was unique to California. Everything state California. Okay, yeah. okay. So the only federal stuff that really intersects with this is bad news mostly. Um, there's a few <laughs> things that are good for us. There's a uh, – the Macintosh decision was a very, like, good federal decision for us. Um and that basically determined, eh, I mean, it's not as, it's good in so far as it determined that if you were operating within the state regulations or state rules, then you're essentially, okay, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, there was the Rohrbach Farr Amendment. The Rohrbach Farr Amendment has got a new name because Rohrbach's no longer in Congress, but the amendment basically said that the DEA and the federal government couldn't spend money to enforce uh, the Controlled Substance Act and prohibition in regulated states where people are following the rules. And so it cut off the funding source for the DEA. Um, that's really the thing that protected us when Sessions took over in um, yeah, like he took away the coal. The coal memorandum is what protected a lot of places, and yeah, Sessions came in and said, "Whoop." Yeah, and so that was something he could do. And were it not for Rohrbach Far, which basically blocked their ability to give any money to, like Congress just cut off the funding source. The DEA couldn't pay the salaries of a DEA agent to go and enforce cannabis laws in regulated states against people that could show that they were operating within the rules within the regulated right. state. Right. Um, the important case law there is the McIntosh decision, which happened in the Ninth Circuit. And essentially, they went after this dude slash group of people who were doing, you know, 215 medical -y shit in like the, the late teens. And I think it was like 15, 14, 2014, something like that. And um, they went after him and they basically were like, look, you can't spend money on any of this and the DEA can't enforce these uh, rules and prosecute us because we're following state rules and regulations and the court found in their, in their favor. And so, that was those two things, that case law and the amendment itself is what's kind of kept uh, the DE or the Department of Justice from being just total shitheads. Right. And in the Cole Memorandum, you know, it was something that I had mentioned there. And that was basically that gave states kind of eight rules to play by uh, in order to do what they wanted to as far as like the legal system obviously you know keep it out of the hands of the kids don't uh, divert it um you know no organized crime etc cetera, etc cetera. but that was really a, a big protection for the business side of the of the community um but yeah that that went away now we haven't really seen that i'm aware of there may be any major crackdowns because of its absence but it does, again, give them that wiggle room should they choose to resume something like that. They have the, the kind of the, the ability to do it, even though they've taken away the means with the roar, uh, roar broker. Yeah, that that yeah, amendment. Yeah, yeah. And it's changed. <laughs> it's, it's totally different now. I can't even remember. But um, that has. Um, that's the thing that's made it so the state systems have, like, everything before 
the Cole Memorandum kind of, like, that helped Washington and Colorado, to be perfectly honest. Um, it fucked California. Um, Prop 64, to a large extent, like, it was going to happen. Like, basically, the Obama administration was like, fuck this shit. They were not, like, they fucking hated California. Um, 215, the system we had was an SV420 was a clusterfuck from the perspective of people who wanted to like good governance and regulations and mm -hmm. shit like that. Like mm -hmm. we were, we were a hot mess and <laughs> they knew how much cannabis was going from California to the rest of the state. Um, and they were shutting it down and being incredibly like, it was hard moving shit in like, from 2010 onward, they were fucking on that shit. And um, essentially the, the Ogden memo, which then became the Cole memo, was put in place to say, hey, if you're going to do this shit, you have to really regulate. It was clear by 2016 that we were going to get some form of legal regulations in the state of California. It was just a question of which ones. There were multiple different options. There was a large coalition that had formed that was working behind one of the options. Um, then, and I mean, the NAACP was involved, um, a massive Latino organization that gets like massive turnout was involved, um, and tons of cannabis people, like lots of different, like lots and lots and lots of different stakeholders came together and had written something and they were regulations that people put together and they had uh, gotten that uh, to the Secretary of State in like mid-2015. Um, a couple months later, a month later, OMA, Adult Use of Marijuana Act, uh, dropped with Sean Parker. And I think he put $50,000 up at the same time. And it was like that $50,000 down payment with their initiative just sucked all the air in the room out or out of the room. And uh, it, that was the only game in town. And it was like, it was signed, sealed, and delivered that day. Everybody knew that Prop 64, as it were, was going to pass and was going to be the thing. And, you know, people took sides. There's the pro camp oh, yeah. and the anti camp. And, like, aside from the criminal justice argument that a number of people made, um, nobody made an economic argument. Everybody, I think, recognized that it's just absolute dog shit from an economic standpoint. Like, we shit the bed in California. Don't do what California did. It's I'm in Washington, man. Oh, we got yeah. the bed warm for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. No, it's it's so bad. In and, you know, unfortunately, uh, the regulated side of things has... Um, the amount of barriers they've created and the... And this is, you know, bringing it full circle. Um the reason there's a lot of hate and like shittiness directed towards Steve D'Angelo is him and his group specifically lobbied for the elimination of the one acre cap. The one acre cap for anybody outside of California who or in who's not like paying attention to it. When Prop 64 went into place, they said that they were going to limit the size of the um, overall canopy to one acre. So if you were going to be the largest operation, you could have one acre of canopy. They were going to limit outside funds and capital until five years. And so it was going to essentially and also um, limit a there's some mega fucking license that's coming online that's going to be like a 10 or 5 acre license or some shit in like okay. the next year or two. But all of that was supposed to be shifted towards five years down the line so that we were supposed to have some sort of 
small legacy farmers mm -hmm. get to operate. Get grandfathered in. Santa Cruz got a mm -hmm. whole bunch of people to sign up. Fucking shut down everybody. There's basically nobody left in Santa Cruz who was an old legacy operator. Wow. All of the legacy operators. And I mean, one of the things about how we operated is we all just went out into like middle of fucking nowhere, dirt road, sort of like out of mind, out of sight sort of places. <laughs> and apparently a UC Berkeley study found that the highest predictor for the location or presence of a cannabis farm is the adjacent of another cannabis farm. <laughs> like that was the only thing when they did like statistics and like tried to figure out where the correlation was. It's literally just whether or not your neighbor grows pot is wow. the likely predictor, the most likely predictor of whether or not you grow pot. Wow. And so we just like, we built these enclaves all over the place and they're not on agricultural land. They're not zoned the way that a lot of agriculture operates. And so as a result, across California, up in the North Coast, they're having all sorts of uh, CEQA issues, California Environmental Quality Act. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're in very hilly, mountainous terrain their watersheds and their very steep ravines and it makes it very difficult to do agriculture in that sort of environment um santa cruz mountains are the same and so there's been a push to put all and site all of the cannabis farms on agricultural land because that's where you do agriculture right, right and agriculture land in the state of california is fucking insanely expensive and it's been used for traditional agriculture which you can't fucking use if you're doing cannabis because of the fucking testing regime that we have in place will pick up all sorts of contaminants from traditional agriculture sites so a lot of people in those cut flower operations were having failed tests early on because of that because just the amount of toxins that had been used in the place over time as well as proximity to other traditional ag and spillover from Drift. spread yeah yeah and so like as a result these different like zoning land use issues have caused lots of legacy farmers to get pushed out and on top of that you've got fucking massive over taxation and massive overproduction in places like Santa Barbara that just let people fucking go off completely unlimited and unhinged. Hmm. And so we, it's, yeah, it's impressive how a bunch of people who, like, from Vietnam War, from the AIDS epidemic, from a, you know, counterculture and a drug underworld, developed a thing that was really incredible and produced a lot of value and created a lot of opportunities oh, yeah. and really developed something that spread across the entire country and like has changed people's lives largely for the better. I mean, there's been lots of problems along the way, but like massive good things were created by that group of people. And then the, like, <laughs> the next option of like lobbyists, tech fucking giants and a few people who thought they were just going to capitalize and control all this shit have just like created a massive steaming pile of shit. It's like all the people who take a helicopter into Burning Man for the week. It's like, you guys are missing the point of what we're trying to do here. But yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's sad that a lot of the legacy people weren't able to to get involved as smoothly or as easily as it should have been you're right you know a lot of that isn't agricultural land but that kind of goes to speak to the ingenuity of these people uh they've turned it into agricultural land and that they've you know they've worked totally and think about it from like do we really want to offset agricultural food production land or yeah, non food production like no we don't like mm -hmm. 
it's actually like as you said like in the literature if you go into the literature and read about hemp one of the main benefits that they were talking about in its application for industrial purposes is oh well we have this crop that doesn't require the absolute best lands mm -hmm. so we can use these suboptimal lands or we can use it for bioremediation or we can use it in places that we would otherwise grow food so it's not going to offset food production because priorities right yeah that's a huge point i mean that's a great point and it, it's it's one of those points that i wonder if they even considered a lot of this stuff to to somebody you know in your position my position it seems kind of common sense um but i was talking earlier with brian and marco and he was talking uh with one of his his legislators uh and and they asked the difference between marijuana and cannabis and it's like these are the people actually writing the freaking laws like you really just asked me this and you're the one deciding my fate and uh yeah. it hasn't helped that you know the the lobbyists or the people with heavily vested interests are the ones in their ear um not uncommon but it, it is kind of unfortunate because yeah it, there's so many people who want to play in the legal landscape should it be a reasonable and fair venture yeah. It's just, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. No, I think that, and oh man, I've, I went back and I listened to one of the, um, so they have regulatory meetings all the time and you can listen to enforcement, the, like the, the board that essentially advises the regulators and talks to the different um, agencies about what's going on in the field. And so I listened to it and it's just absolutely mind boggling to listen to these people who are supposed to be giving advice to the regulators about priorities and what to do, who fully don't understand that they're operating at two completely like cross purposes they want to on one hand create a pathway for legacy and traditional producers into the legal framework while also figuring out how to punitively punish them for right. operating outside of that system when there are barriers to their entry that are like they're literally doing nothing to address the barriers to entry, which are the thing that will solve this over here, not punishing them. Punishing legacy producers is not going to get them to work in the system. It's going to convince <laughs> them that the system is designed to fuck them. Yeah. If, if they, you know, if they didn't concede and give up to the mountain and all that it threw at them over the years, they're not going to concede to a couple of little lawmakers that are, trying to you know push some paper at them so that that is something that they need to consider um there there's always there's always an alternative market um it would be great if there was a unified uh a unified law instead of a patchwork of them because even like you mentioned santa barbara uh it sounded like they were going crazy in washington it's different we have a set number of licenses for producers period um, and they're, they're issued by the state. It doesn't go by the county. It doesn't go by the region. It's by the state. So there's no one. Well, there is a lot of production gathered over on the east side of the mountains because of the natural sun. You get a lot of the larger outdoor farms there. But um, yeah, you can't you can't just go can't go crazy with it. Yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, we're in California. Um, we've always like. I mean. It was part of the reason why the Obama administration was targeting and cracking down on us. We were producing a lot of cannabis for export, and <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> There's no reason not to. Like, I understand the laws say that we can't, but that's dumb, and it would make a lot more sense to capture this value. And it's just like California on the regulatory side is doing everything that should not be done uh and i just yeah i, I see that 
personally, I'm biased. I think California cannabis is great, and I, I know a lot of people outside of California would differ because, <laughs> you know, yeah. But it's one of those things where we had something that was unique and had a lot of value, and it's losing and diminishing returns in terms of the value that we've got in terms of California cannabis because of what they did and how they uh, develop these regulations. And it's it's sad um, because a lot of really, really like, we won't see the best cannabis from California in the legal market. You're gonna see the yeah. best cannabis in California in somebody's bag that, you know, is eight ounces or less or something. Maybe more if your doctor <laughs> says you can have more, but like, that's where the best bag is gonna be yeah. because you know, unfortunately, the, we are limited to six plants in the state of California under okay. the regulations, um, unless your doctor says you are allowed more. So, mm -hmm. you know, get your doctor's recommendation, have your doctor uh, say that your medical needs are such that you require more than six plants of cannabis and grow your cannabis. And if they want to challenge you, fight for your rights and actually actually have documentation so that you can stand on your rights. Uh, Dr. Frank Lucido, is, he's been my doctor for years. He's one of the, behind Todd Mercury, like. Uh, okay, that's a legend like, right there. Yeah, like Todd was like, Todd and Dr. Frank are like the two, like two of the best doctors in the field of cannabis medicine. Um, Dr. Frank was one of the doctors who he got the medical licensing board wanted to take away his, uh, license for recommending cannabis to a kid with ADHD who was taking Ritalin otherwise. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. he, you know, gave, he authorized a recommendation for this kid. They then wanted to um revoke his license for authorizing cannabis to a child and he fought the case and won um and so that's he's a good doctor that's out there and uh, he's still operating and can be i mean he switched over to full-time from a family practitioner to a full-time uh 215 medical uh practice and has done recommendations to tons of people for years. And so as it, it sounds like as far as us as individuals, as patients, one of your first step, I mean, if you do have a legit, legitimate medical need for cannabis, you're using cannabis for these reasons, um, the first step of protection is finding a recommendation. That That's kind of what it sounds like to me, because that that is where it starts. And to do that, you have to find kind of the right doctor. That's something that in Washington changed when it went from medical to rec. And to, and to be completely honest, it pissed, it still pisses me off because our fucking med system is, as we know it, is gone. But it was to the point to where if you had $200 and a hangnail, you were getting your medical prescription. So I understand. And then that led into co-ops because they didn't regulate co-ops and so here's somebody holding a hundred prescriptions or a hundred recommendations for people and they got a warehouse and yada 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 that's something else um so so there did need to be a little bit of change but the unfortunate part of that was when that changed it is not easy to find a doctor that will write you a recommendation in washington anymore and, and if you do actually happen, I'll, I'll say one more thing. If you do actually happen to find that doctor, yeah, you get a, a six plant limit up to 15. You are given six. And most of these doctors are informed enough that if you let them know that you use edibles or you need to make RSO, they understand that takes more plant material. So they're more likely to give you a higher plant count if you're a person who needs edibles or RSO which a lot of doctors will encourage because you're not inhaling smoke. So that's, that's something to remember when you're speaking with your doctor. Um, but was it similar in California? Was it 
is it still as easy to get a recommendation as it was, you know, pre uh, Prop 64 or have, has that tightened as well down there? <clears throat> so this is where California is unique. Um, yes, it's tightened, but it's tightened more just because there's not as many. It's like, it was an industry back in the day. Like, yeah, there, right. were, there were wreck <laughs> mills, basically. Yeah. Like, they just, there were doctors pumping these things out. Mm -hmm. There were other doctors who required that you had some sort of primary physician that you were going and seeing, and that that primary physician was aware of your cannabis consumption, and that you had specific issues that were documented in your, you know, patient case history. And you would have to bring this to your, you know, your annual checkup with your doctor and your doctor would then do an assessment and look at your symptoms and give you an assessment and, you know, assess your cannabis use, etc. <coughs> and I did that, I believe, I have over 15 recommendations or 16 recommendations from Dr. Frank that I kept and maintained oh, wow. every cool. year. Yeah. And so those, for me at this point, like, technically speaking, were I ever to have an issue, I have a well-established medical history as a qualified patient. I'm never going to not be a qualified patient at any point in the future of my life. I don't okay. have a shoulder socket. Right. It's not coming back. The pain associated <laughs> with the not having a shoulder socket and, like, Essentially, it's just, it's stupid. My, like, my muscles hold my arm in place mm. in place of the fact that my, I don't have a socket. And if I put my arm in the wrong fucking place, like, it just rolls out and dislocates. And there's, like, nothing I can do about it. Um, other than, like, you know, figure out how to work it back in. But, uh, I can see I can see the cop right now. I don't believe you, son. I'm not letting you go until you do it. <laughs> yeah. But um and so because of that medical history, I can go forward without actually having a medical recommendation. Now, if I have an interaction like Tabitha fucking Chavez of the DCC believed me not one bit when I said <laughs> I'm a medical patient without a rec, you know? Right. Um, had I produced a rec, that maybe would have changed the discussion, but not really. That would have, as she pointed out to me when we were talking, she was like, that's a uh, health and uh, safety code issue, which is an issue for the Santa Rosa police. And I said, fine, let's bring the Santa Rosa police yeah. over. Like, See what they say. Cool. Yeah. They'll be like, we don't and, want to bother with this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, they maybe would have been like, where's your wreck? And I've been like, I don't have it on me. And then we would have seen what would have happened. But like the case law there has already been established. Okay. They don't have to have a physical recommendation on me. Having that in my medical case history that I could present at trial would be sufficient to prove that I'm a qualified patient. Um, but like, that's one of those things where we've unfortunately regressed in the post 64 era where we now, you know, it's good to have your card on you and to assert that and to present it to say, look, no, I am a documented qualified patient. I can have this cannabis on me in excess of an ounce if you ever find yourself in that situation right. because you are less likely to be fucked with than if you just assert it. And right. I don't know why the fuck they, like, didn't, like... I mean, aside from the fact that they were just straight up jacking people at the Emerald Cup and had no legal basis for what they were doing, um, yeah. like, if it were a cop, like, I would totally, like, most cops, like, I would understand them either taking the box or ejecting me or something. But, like, the DCC has no right to go to random jackasses with bags of <laughs> cannabis and be like, give me that. Like, they can go to a licensed person and being like, hey, licensee, you're doing illegal cannabis sales. 
that's not okay. We need to, you know, and it can be something as stupid as like, it's not labeled right, you know? Yeah. yeah. To, like, quarantine your weed and like dispose of it. And there are protocols for that and there are rules for that. And there's like a whole manifest and all this different shit that they have to do. Walking around with pounds of fucking herb in a fucking trash bag with like LaCroix and fucking Starbucks cups and shit is not it. Like, that's not how, like, that's just, that's straight up stealing people's cannabis and strong arming them. And then, you know, who the fuck knows what the fuck happened with that stuff? Like, there is no, I, I actually, on that, to that point, um, right before when I checked my email to get the link, um, yeah. uh, I got an email and I posted it on, on the gram, um, they responded to my public records act request. Cause after all my <laughs> shit with the fucking, uh, the DCC cops at the Emerald cup. Um, and then the reporting that happened afterwards, particularly, um, I think it's Lisa, uh, oh, fuck, I see names, uh, K mud, K mud did a report. I apologize to the reporter. Um, and they're, they're in Northern California radio station, yeah, right? Humble, yep. humble, humble, local yeah. radio station out of humble. Yep. Um, they did some reporting on the uh, harvest ball, and after they fucked with me, they went and they fucked with uh, the small farmers. There was a scholarship group that basically a bunch of small farmers Jeez. were allowed to come in for free and have a booth and have direct sales to customers. Some of them had their own personal medical medical or recreational, it doesn't matter, but it was their own personally grown cannabis. And it was display cannabis to be able to say like, okay, this is what you are going to be purchasing from us. But like, you have to go through all these different, like, you know, hoops to buy it. So, and you can't like show them the cannabis or whatever that's like in the rec market. So they had these samples to be like, look, you buy that variety. It's this, check it out cool, sniff, sniff, you want to buy it, go over there, sort of thing. And that's how they were doing it. The same people, literally the same dude, Officer White, fucking in the pictures, yeah. He (laughs) went over and uh, started harassing them and telling them to put away their jars and that they couldn't display it. There are rules allowing you to do this display. So you can do that. And they... And apparently they had all already jumped through these like stupid hoops that ended up being the solution, which was they were all already employees of the distributor who was allowing these transactions to happen at the event. So a whole bunch of stupid inside baseball bullshit. But the point is, is that the small farmers at the event were not violating any rule had already jumped through the necessary hoops that the BCC cops said, hey, jump through this hoop. All just to be like, hey, here's a jar of the same cannabis you're going to be buying over there, but this is from my personal staff. And so that um, was all covered by KMUD. And in response to it, the DCC claimed that they had not confiscated any cannabis at the event zero cannabis bull shit <laughs> bullshit <laughs> yeah i mean we've we've all seen the pictures and that's i totally i totally want to dive into this now but yeah keep please keep elaborating on this because i don't even think matlock or murder she wrote could explain this one man jessica fletcher is not on this case how do how do you have a big bag of stuff photographed numerous times and say wasn't me yeah and i mean as if that like the implication there then is that like some serious crimer shit just happened like officer white just stole pounds of cannabis that are now unaccounted for like i can't hold eight ounces of fucking untrimmed cannabis in my box like (laughs) But where's but where's it, where's where's their merc or their data track system? It, Don't they it, have to log it, every gram that they confiscate? You know, boop, 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 
<laughs> exactly. No, there's a um, there's a whole section in the regulations about um, embargoed cannabis. And so embargoed. Can, yeah, so they can embargo it. Um, they have a, an emergency order that they could do, and I think they may be had, had been like invoking this section of the, the rules. Um, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Um, they also uh, there are like there's some specific language about when they can uh, seize cannabis but when you look at it like it's really shittily written like it doesn't authorize them to actually seize cannabis as far as I read it from Wooks at events Mm -hmm. so dumbass with 8 ounces of weed isn't the guy that they're allowed to seize weed from is the way it seems to be written. Um, And the fact that their response is just to flat out deny photographic evidence of a thing and just be like, cannabis? Like, okay, so my homie, kids, high school, my friends, sister was going to public school we were all homeschooled and like she was in public school and she got in trouble for having some cannabis and her brother was conveying this to the dad and being like yeah she got busted with some herb and the dad's like yeah where'd she get the herb he's like herb what herb i was like that was literally dude's response and we're like (laughs) The herb we're talking about, your sister getting busted with. Because everybody <laughs> knew, dude gave her this fucking herb. <laughs> and at least dad did. And so, like, the fact that they responded like a fucking 16 year old stoner who just passed a bag of weed to their sister is like fucking amateur hour. Um, but this is their actual response. Um, DCC observed violations of state law by vendors and attendees. That'd be me. This included (laughs) non-vendor attendees. Definitely me. Entering the event with large amounts of cannabis and cannabis product. Exceeding personal possession limits. That's debatable. To give away or sell to others on site. That was never established. DCC did not seize confiscate or destroy any cannabis product as a result of these violations, but instead worked with event organizers and where applicable licensees to address these issues. <laughs> oh man, I just I just had the horrible rave days flashback where all the dealers who weren't with the promoter would get rounded up and they'd get their shit taken from them and everything like that. And at the end of the night the promoter's counting it out. So, uh, you know, I, I, I highly doubt that the uh, DMCC or whoever the freaker people are were in bed uh, with the Emerald Cup too and that. But you said that and I'm like, oh, that's some shady shit. But it, it had to go somewhere. And, and that's the thing. Like, there, there's no denying that this officer was in possession of a bag at one point. We can't prove where it went. We can't prove whatever happened to it. But we can reasonably show that this person was in possession of it. Um, You know, I think that'd be irresponsible if he left it sitting on a bus stop bench by the school. You know, who knows what they did with it because they won't tell us. Are they actually going to have to answer for that? Or are they just waiting for you to forget about it and everybody else? Like, it'll go away. It'll go away. Um, probably, but I don't know. I mean, like, uh, so I filed a Public Records Act request because I wanted an answer about this because there's got to be some form of documentation. Um, I asked for uh, Tabitha Chavez. So for context, Tabitha Chavez is the head enforcement officer for the state of California. All of California cannabis, like, there's, if you go on to the CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture, um, you go onto their website, there's Richard Parrott. He's like the top head dude. There's some other person, can't remember their name off the top of my head. And then there's Tabitha Chavez. 
She's the third person in the leadership team. She's the head enforcement officer for the state. She was the person that they all deferred to. Like, Officer mm -hmm. White was the initial dude, but, like, she was the, like, end boss. Okay. And the fact that she was there, like, you asked earlier about, like, are they required to be there or do they choose to be there? Right. My interpretation of it, and the, I've been told different things that, like, for some reason, the higher-ups do these, like, kind of menial uh, enforcement, like, in the field tasks. But the fact that they had 13 officers there mm -hmm. at that time and the absolute head of the entire enforcement regime on site to crack down on idiots like me with a box of fucking cannabis is insane. Like, sounds like sounds like a fun little field trip. Yeah, let's go to Emerald. Come on, come. Well, yeah, and like I, I, I mean, that's a, you know, I've known a number of people who have used uh, the opportunity of a government uh, meeting or whatever it may be for a uh, oh. Let's go to Napa. Let's go to <laughs> Sonoma. You know, uh, so that's that's a thing. Um, but yeah, like the fact that she was on site and dealing with the books in particular is just like goofy as fuck and really like clown shit for the department. They shouldn't be interfacing with me, and they shouldn't be losing to dumbasses like me. Like they shouldn't. <laughs> Like, if they're going to do that, they can't, like, let the guy just walk away with the, the box of cannabis, but that happened. Um, so then uh, I asked for her emails. Um, Nicole Elliott, the head of DCC's emails about enforcement at the Harvest Ball, mostly just because I want to have an idea of what their plan was or what they were thinking and, like, why they were, like, we as the public have a right to know why such heavy handed enforcement happened at this event. This was unique. There have been many, many, many events in the state of California that have happened post Prop 64. This is the most heavy enforcement that we've seen. There's been other events where there's been enforcement even at the Emerald Cup, but this was by far the most heavy handed we've ever seen. And so public interest, we have a right to know. Um, what they were, you know, talking about. Why, yeah, why, why, why such a heavy presence at that particular event? Why such the higher ups, you know, that are typically in the office? Why were they there? Like, what, what was the agenda? They, there had to have been a team meeting before they went out that day. Exactly. What, what was in, What was the team meeting about? Exactly. And then um, I also want to know: Did they cite anybody? And did they? <laughs> Um, do they have any record of what happened to what was confiscated? Mm -hmm. And so that answers the, the, yeah, will they have to answer it? Now, how long do they have to they have 14 act days. with? Oh, that's not a very long time. Okay. No. Yeah, no, the Public Records Act is in the state of California, aside from the fact that there are a fuck ton of statutory exemptions, um, <laughs> it's dope. Uh, I've gotten a lot, a lot, like, yeah, I have pretty much entire, like, terms of supervisors' correspondence from just, to the point where they, they stopped accepting my request for, like, all of their email communications and made right. me start, like, giving them a lot more specific, but, like, Email communications from government officials and public records is one of the most valuable resources in terms of the Public Records Act because mm -hmm. there is a ton of information that is exchanged through government emails and you can, by limiting your search to 30 days um, and setting clear uh, subject uh, restrictions it's really hard for them to not reply to those and to not produce um, responsive documents um, that said there are a lot of exemptions and ways for them to get around it 
And, and that is something that is, I'm sure, very state to state, but every state has these public records cool. requests available. And that's a, you know, that's a, that's a very intelligent way to kind of come at this. Um, because yes, they are public employees. And yes, again, there, there had to have been a team meeting and email chain regarding what their intents and purposes were for this particular event. You know, again, they didn't just wake up and said, Hey, everybody put on your green vest today. We're going out. So very, very, very smart move. And, and I hope that brings some answers uh i don't know have you ever gotten the public record request where everything except like the words and and with were blacked out does that really happen um not where i made requests uh okay. at a certain point they started um redacting uh non-public officials like email addresses on the privacy thing. privacy yeah. concerns yeah and, okay. yeah and that, that made sense um Prior to that, um, oh, I mean, like, John, yeah, uh, definitely if you send a lawyer's uh, Public Records Act request, you will have a higher probability of getting it. But I've also, like, I have submitted uh, over 100. Wow. Like, so I, I, that was my jam. Like, I fucked with them. And like, <laughs> when they got to the point where they stopped responding because I was being an asshole, I basically like, I sued them and would have pursued it um, had we not essentially won by other means. Um, but nice. we had a Brown Act violation lawsuit and a Public Records Act element to the lawsuit. And it... It was, yeah, it slapped, but uh, Public Records Act in California is pretty, pretty interesting, and it's definitely, um, really what you find is that they find really bullshit ways of, like, I'm pretty sure that they can get out of responding to a bunch of my requests simply because I'm asking for uh, deliberations regarding an enforcement action, and... Hmm. Uh, deliberations, administrative deliberations are exempt from disclosure. And so all they have to do is cite the administrative uh, deliberation exemption and be like, yeah, we were deliberating how to fucks with you guys. You don't get to see that. Right. I don't get to see that. Um, right. The, the, the popular uh, catch all national security. Yeah. Can't, can't, can't tell you. Why did I tie my shoe that way? Can't tell you. National security. Yeah. yeah. That's that's a catch all of when you don't want to answer anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways for them to get out of it, but it's at least they were very prompt and responsive and um, it was a pretty large request. And the fact that they got back to me and said, yes, we're processing your request and we'll get back to you in 14 days is a good sign. We'll see what ends up coming of it. I mostly would, as you've asked, like, is there a way for us to find out what the fuck happened to mm -hmm. the bag? Like, yeah, for real. That's that's really what I'd like to know about because there's stuff in there that people who had their stuff confiscated have a right to get back. They didn't. That was yeah. all taken without due process. So because it was just simply seized and said, put this in our bag or else, and then voluntarily given over. That was done under the auspices of enforcement and the letter of the law. And right, so right. even though you, they did voluntarily comply, and that is not the thing to do typically, like right. don't voluntarily comply, say no. Well, he, but, yeah. To the extent that you can't say no, but particularly at the Emerald Cup, if you go there with like seeds to trade, like they have no fucking yeah. jurisdiction over that. They do yeah. not have the right to like, it's a good idea to not show up with like clearly commercial packaged seeds that that looks like a commercial thing. Yeah. But if you're fucking trading seeds in like Ziploc bags or whatever the fuck, 
that are not like, <laughs> you know, branded merch, like that is outside of their purview. Right. You are allowed to give seats to people mm -hmm. and they're not in the state of California. The DCC does not regulate whether or not adults over 21 can give each other hemp seats. Yeah, and I'll just say, too, I mean, obviously anybody listening or watching, I'm sure you're intelligent enough to realize that we are not lawyers. But, um, yes, yes. you know, uh, I would be Bill S. Preston Esquire if I was. Um, but how I understand it, too, is, you know, the hemp bill kind of made it cool for um, – seeds only because they contain less than that 0.03 percent of thc so anything under that should be covered under the hemp bill we're all good with that um but yeah no they, they absolutely should have to account for that uh, because it's not just a um logistics logistical question from our standpoint uh that that could you know be a sign of endemic corruption I mean, if, if somebody is pocketing it, secondary marketing it, uh, you know, who knows what happens with these things. The, if this was a regular police force and this was caught on film, they absolutely would have to be able to account for that. So to hear that this agency that really didn't even have jurisdiction over the people that they confiscated these things from, obviously confiscated them and there's no accounting for it, uh, God, I would really think the higher ups would would be interested in something like that. Yeah, and I I feel like exactly like if we had pictures, like they've got plenty of evidence and they've established the case against the Ronard Park dude, who uh, Officer Tatum, who for anybody who doesn't know the case, there's a a police officer in Ronard Park, which is on the 101, which Mendocino Humboldt the emerald triangle is on the like <laughs> I used north to... side of the 101 and runner park is on the south side and you yeah. gotta go through it if you're driving down the 101 I, I i used to i used to when i lived in santa rosa i worked in runner park and if wow. you meet somebody from runner park they'll tell you this is where they filmed american graffiti so if you've seen american graffiti you've seen runner park <laughs> yeah <laughs> old and, film sorry <laughs> and they uh like it's you know the 101 like driving the 101's a gauntlet it, even today it's still fucking shitty because you know people move down the 101 with a lot of cannabis over, over the years and that dude was just like straight up jacking people like full-on like crazy crazy jacking people and one of the guys that he jacked was a former police officer from texas and the former police officer from texas was moving herb and uh was not the guy to be fucking with. And yeah. That's Don't a, mess with Texas, man. Their <laughs> freaking license plate says it. Yeah. And like, dude, full on, like, um, he, yeah, it's crazy. But the Officer Tatum story is a story of an officer who was just jacking people on the 101, taking money, taking cannabis, and doing a shakedown. If there was video evidence the way that there's video evidence of the shakedown, it would you know would have been even more damning. Yeah, I, I, I just got my towns backwards. I'm sorry. I was like, oh back in my head. It was Petaluma where they filmed American graffiti. But Petaluma, Roner Park, Santa Rosa, they're all like within the same fifteen yeah. minute span, so yeah. sue me. <laughs> but I had to correct myself there. Cause yeah, that was one of the one of the points of pride of that town, um, but yeah, that that is uh, crazy. Because again, when you when you don't um, there, when you don't have good legal standing or information, you are very easily persuaded to do things against your will. And so, yeah, a lot of cops, in, in particular, in that advantage, uh, you know, I've been in that situation where it's like, hey, if if that just stays with you, I can leave. Sounds like a good deal to me. All right, I'm out. Um, oh, yeah. No, I've, yeah. I've been there. I mean, I had a, uh, I mean, I was fucked. Like, dude had me. So, like, I had just sparked a joint and driving down a hill. 
don't drive and smoke cannabis, but yeah. that notwithstanding, uh, yeah, well, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> so I was driving, cop pulled out in front of me. Uh, I had to lock him up to avoid hitting the cop because he came out of no, like literally backed up from a blind spot onto the road. And so he pulled forward, got behind me, pulled me over once we got to the like next pull out and did a sobriety test. And I passed the sobriety test. He, I showed him my recommendation and told him I had cannabis and yeah, he seized both of them. Mm -hmm. And that was right at that was in that time period where mm -hmm. they were taking people's wrecks and you know, doing all the entrapment shit. And that was just the standard operating procedure was they would take your cannabis and they take your wreck and try and get you for a DUI. And that was like, those were the three ways they could kind of fuck you back then. And in the end, it all like no charges were pressed and I got my wreck back. I didn't get my like, you know, small bag of personal or whatever. Um, and that, that was very much how things went back in the day. And, you know, um, I think at this point, people, it, it would be nice that, and I haven't, aside from my personal experience in Emerald Cup, I do not know another adult in the state of California who has had cannabis of any, like, not massive quantity seized from them by a cop. But if you do, right. like, you definitely want to try and invoke your medical right and know that the specific statute that you can invoke is, um, it's Health and Safety Code Section 11362.77. Okay, Memorize that. that. <laughs> <laughs> or or go to your Instagram, which is actually in the uh, in the show notes here, your Instagram, and I'll pull up again the the post that you're talking about here, where you did share the one one three six two seven. Am I getting close now? I'm just trying to memorize that one one three six two point seven. Okay. Yep. Okay, so yeah, we'll put that up there. That's that's up on your Instagram. But yeah, you know, I, I do want to go through that um, before before we go. Um, I want to kind of maybe cover that in, in a little more detail just from the firsthand experience, because, again, not many people have been in your shoes, um, whether, you know, the officers walked away or not. Um, for a lot of people, these types of interactions are not common. And, you know, we, we, we spoke before this, I grew up skateboarding in, you know, like suburbia. So I dealt with cops a lot. Um, I know how to talk with, talk to them. I know how to get, get out of trouble, but it's intimidating. And then one of the things that I noticed uh, about your interaction, uh, and I think you even said this, or maybe somebody said it in the comments, but it was, you know, it's like surround and divide. So for for somebody who's never been in that experience can you maybe walk through from kind of how like the initial interaction took place did they come and tap you on the shoulder and then just maybe kind of like your feelings or what your brain did you're like okay i'm getting surrounded what do i need to do at this point so you obviously had people there and stuff but i, I think that would be beneficial i want people to know or to at least think of a game plan go go into these situations prepared because they try to intimidate you and they can be intimidating so totally and i didn't do what you should have done fully i mean i did a couple things right but i did other things that or didn't do <laughs> things that i should have so what happened really was i was like showing i mean fuck Here's the box. <laughs> the uh, box. I'm surprised that hasn't gone up on eBay for like five thousand yeah, dollars yet, man. That's the box, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and like, like, I mean, we're talking about stuff like this. Like, it's like scraggly. That's you know, my lighting sucks in here, but like, right. this is not trimmed herb. Doesn't I meet mean, the definition that you described yeah, earlier. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. <laughs> 
I'm showing specifically this stuff and some other flavors from to Masonic. Um, I had some seeds from him that I grew out this year, and it was a, a bunch of his like land racy sort of crosses, like the Panama Red and um, uh, the Willie Nelson um, Northern Lights Five Willie Nelson Wilson, and so. I was showing him those, and I'm just describing the phenos to him. Like, mm -hmm. I have a video of it, and I'll try and post it later. But it, like, it literally shows the moment. And so, like, I'm handing each different pheno and describing the variations in the phenos of these Panama Red, uh, L.A. Uh, Pure Kush Wilson crosses and the other cross. And that's all that's happening like he's just putting each one into his hand and hearing the descriptions and then looking at the next one and so on and then this like hand comes out of like right like there's rust brand uh brandon rust is right here and then like masonic's right here another homie's like standing right here and there's this little open spot and this dude like comes into the open spot and like, fucking presents his badge, like, well, uh, okay. da, 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 da. Identifies now, himself right away. Okay, yeah. fair play, fair play. And he says, what's going on here, fellas? This is a licensed cannabis event. You blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, we're just, like, this is my personal head stash. I'm showing it to my friends. That's all that's happening. And he then demands that I throw it in his, like, trash bag full of confiscated herb. And or go to the front gate to deal with cops. And I'm like, you know, I'm like down on the ground, like, no, 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 dude, like, no. I'm going to a booth. I'm going to kick it at the Future Cannabis Project booth down with Peter, who I had just like passed and said hey to. Um, and so <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be sitting with my box of cannabis, consuming my box of cannabis, showing it to people and doing media stuff and like, you know, doing the live feed and kicking it over there. And he, we went back and forth and he's like, well, you need to take me to your booth. And so we go over there and he's like, bring me your licensee. And well, you know, Peter's not a licensee. Royal Gold's not a licensee. None of us are licensees. And I explain, this is a media booth. I can have my personal cannabis and can consume my personal cannabis while doing media stuff here at this booth without a licensee. And honestly, like we had shifted spots. So we had been in like the main thoroughfare and they had me like, we had like a group of homies, Bam was there, uh, Brandon Rust was there, um, fucking uh, Kaya Pacific Northwest Roots, um ghost kush family organics like everybody like bunch of cats like all the cats that are the heads that like showed up in that moment like converged at that moment were like reunion the ranch was there like all the homies and so we're all there and that honestly like shout out to every one of them because the fact that i had like I was somebody who had a bunch of homies and had a bunch of other people who were immediately like, nah, fuck that. Other people didn't have that and got fucked with. And that's part of, you know, the intimidation tactics. And like when we were down in like the thoroughfare, we were all surrounded. And I was actually more uncomfortable being surrounded by all of them because I didn't know how many I could tell there was a fuck ton of them, but I didn't know exactly how many there were. Um, when we got over to this area and I'm like posted up against the wall and they tried to like, you know, had the fucking like 13 or whatever, like yeah. circling me. Um, I was fine. Like, you know, it just, I'm honestly like better being cornered and like uh, with a wall behind mm -hmm. me. Cause I can be like, okay, here's all these people who suck. Um, <laughs> and then, That's so true. Keep them in front of you. Yeah, and then um, and by that point I was dealing with Tabitha Chavez and it was fucking me up because I knew who she was. Well, I had recognized her from a past, like, uh, 
she had come to Calaveras County to do a like environmental health thing, and she gave a presentation saying how terrible cannabis was and how terrible all the sites she goes to are and how dumb all the cannabis farmers are. And <laughs> we have a contingent of people in Calaveras County who Dennis Mills was the supervisor at the time, who's a like rabid prohibitionist. And he had his whole little crew there. And we were there because we had to show up to every different event. And she, um, I just like, I recognized her from that event, but I couldn't place it. And it kept throwing me in the moment at the cup. And then the next morning I woke up and was like, oh, fuck. And like looked up the event and sure enough, there she was, looked up, you know, other stuff. And yeah, and so Tabitha Chavez came in and she was basically, she was very clear that she was, she was not down with letting me walk out of there with my cannabis. And it was really just like we went back and forth so many times and i just kept saying like i'm here i'm meeting up with my friends i'm showing them my cannabis i'm gonna smoke my cannabis while i do this fucking event like this is personal medical head stash and they had like their only response was then you're gonna have to deal with the cops and when i kept being like okay <laughs> they just finally were like well like call the event guy and that's who dude's talking to, or like the guy's like on the phone calling over the Emerald Cup event, like liaison, who then escorted me off of the premises, profusely pol apologetic, very helpful, very much totally on my side and in the camp and tried to be like, oh yeah, no, this is totally legit and okay. Um, but then had to be like, oh fuck, okay, let's escort you out. Yeah, um, they they've got to they've got to be they've got to be cool too, you know. Yeah, and I mean that's the thing; they're the ones that, at the end of the day, these the DCC has agency or jurisdiction over. They regulate the licensee, and the re yeah. licensee is very much beholden to them. And the event could just get shut down; they could yeah. literally have just been like. Yeah. Yeah. Pull the plug, everybody fucking events over. Um, so thankfully they didn't do that, I guess. Um, but still, uh, Tabitha Chavez, um, yeah, like that was okay. Your question, sorry, I rambled. Um, yeah, no, no, no worries. So, so they came, he, the officer white came into your circle and said, Hey, uh, you got, you got to put this in the box. And then it was kind of getting pushed into the corner. They tried to separate you from your friends, um, but the homies stood tough because they kind of knew what was going on there. Yeah. So have a down ass set of homies. That's one. Like, <laughs> yes. get that. Um, and like every one of those cats who was there, like, was there. And like, fully from like point A to point Z was like down to help. Uh, you know what's good? Full on, this needs a point that needs to get made. This fucked them up, Tabitha Chavez in particular. Um, one, he was kind of like, I'm your lawyer, wink, wink, uh, which was really <laughs> funny because she's like, I see you winking. And it's like, dude, like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, as if that, damn, he's not a lawyer now. <sighs> Shit. Like, <laughs> fuck. That's um, too funny. Yeah. But, um, he he was on point though because he was like this is non-thc smokable cbd hemp and you have no jurisdiction over it this is perfectly legal i can carry as much of this as i want i can go down to the 7-eleven i can buy it i can smoke it and there's nothing you can do about it and he was like spitting that like that just like chapter and verse like boom 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 and he kept saying it and didn't stop and was just like no you can't prove it otherwise prove it otherwise yeah yeah like and because he was able to like that just dumbfounded her and like she had no response to that particular argument when i'm like okay. it's medical 
she was like, I'm going to get the copy, fucking hippie. And so that that was how they responded to um, 215 defenses. But at the end of the day, they didn't get the cop. They got the event organizer because cops aren't going to fuck with this. Because like we had said earlier, criminal prosecution of this shit isn't worth it. Like civil, like fucking having a fucking rent a cop go and be like, hey, you're doing too much of the cannabis in this and on this premises, like, that's how they fuck with people. You're fined X amount of dollars. Like, Cause yeah. it, it, it works for them. They're there again. The, when I first saw you post this, uh, you know, I, I, I think I posted up. It's like, I bet $10 that they walked away going like, didn't expect that one. Cause people don't, people don't resist. Uh, even even if they suspect that they're right, because this is something that we've fought for so long, we just feel lucky to get away with it and not have anything worse happen than getting our weed taken. But yeah. that's not right. That's not the answer. So, yeah, and and two things on that. One, I want to like tell a little historical story and anecdote, and mention a person I forgot uh, from back in the day who deserves mention. Um, but also. What I didn't do or what I did do, what I think needs to be done in that situation is one, have the down asset. Two, remain very calm and do not let them frazzle you. Um, don't also like stay in a like crouched position. Um, stand up, take up space. Don't do it in an intimidating way, but do it in a way that allows you to present yourself as you would like to present yourself to be most persuasive and to be heard and to affirm your rights and say, stand up for your rights. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but um, you want to do that. You don't want to be intimidating and you want to remain very calm. I think like one thing I did throughout the whole thing was remain like calmer than you are, dude. Um, <laughs> so, that's helpful. Then the other thing to do is, and what I didn't do is like every one of those officers, sh sh I should have gone around and identified every one of them and made every one of them show me their badge and actually take a picture of it as a way of recording. If you are a officer in any you know, a peace officer or whatever, and you're going to detain somebody or stop somebody and do what they did by surrounding somebody like myself or a group of someone's like us that were surrounded, we have every right to know who everyone involved was when we were surrounded. Um, and so when he flashed his badge instead of just being like, what? Like, don't right. tase me, bro. Um, <laughs> don't tase like, me. Fucking, okay, let me see your badge and let me actually hold you accountable long term. I love that they did the fucking hat thing. I mean, I'm sure it cost a little extra and was probably unnecessary, but it's convenient for our purposes in identifying Porky White and the, the, the squad. And so I appreciate that. Um, but that's something when a police officer or a um you know because that's another thing like motherfuckers pretend to be cops these days and fucking jack fools as well and that's a real thing and i know that was yeah. happening a lot up in calaveras and in other yeah. places so you know you want to have people identify themselves and present identification and you want a record of that identification because officer tatum might jack your shit officer white might jack your shit or some crook ass motherfucker may show up pretending to be a cop. Not that like getting a picture of his badge is going to fucking help, but you know. right. And and again, that's something that you know I think an ACLU, uh, American Civil Civil Liberties Union, is a good place to go and check in. You know, like specific rights, just kind of dealing with police. I don't necessarily think that they specialize or focus on cannabis too much, although it's under their purview of what they do. Um, but I remember when I was. Uh, 
you know, probably 13, 14 year old skater kid. I had a little ACO, your rights in the police pamphlet that I always had in my back pocket because again, I had to deal with them frequently. Uh, so I, I, I kind of knew what they could and they couldn't do. Um, but I think that it is generally, again, we're not lawyers, but I think that that is the one thing they have to present is as far as like identification is their badge, the name and the number kind of like we, at minimum have to produce an ID in most circumstances. Um, and I've asked for that on situations. And again, they'll, they'll push back. You don't need to see that. Why do you need to see that? You don't need to see that. I'm the law. I'm the one in charge here. I'm the one telling you what we're going to do. And a lot of times you're like, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Don't get taken advantage of it in that way. Especially, you know, if there wasn't the, the plethora of video of this situation, uh, sun grown mids, how would you even know who you talk to? You know, the, these are the important little details that if something does ever come to it, court case or whatnot, these are the little details you need to know. Yeah, totally. And I mean, anybody who did have their stuff taken and wants to pursue it and actually see what happened or get their stuff back, like people have mentioned the potential of a lawsuit. And like for me, I was inconvenienced. I don't think the court would be like, yeah, you have real harms here. Um, you have to prove damages. What, what is your damages? Exactly. What's your monetary damage? Yeah, but somebody who had their shit taken could has something to prove or has something mm -hmm. they could point to. And if it's not, if it's a fucking pack of seeds and it's not a crime and you can confirm with a lawyer that like, hey, having X amount of seeds at the fucking Emerald Cup in your possession is not a fucking, is not something that is criminally prosecutable. It's totally reasonable to try and defend your right and get your seeds back. And I say that only in so much as like, it's probably an inconvenience. It's probably a cost. There may be some way that we could ameliorate those costs, but the, point is is that if we could establish a case law here or a precedence here where they go and they try to seize seeds in particular mm -hmm. from somebody in an event like this and can get it confirmed by the courts that that is not within the purview of the DCC in their seizure because there's specific statutory regulations that authorize them to seize shit if they're not authorized to seize shit like seeds from people, we can then have events where we can come together without necessarily a cannabis consumption or a cannabis sales on site, but we can have events then that don't require cannabis licenses where we can trade cannabis seeds. And there is no regulatory agency in the like the state regulatory agency like the DCC that can come after us for holding an illegal sesh or the cops for doing anything illegal if we establish in case law that we can have this amount of seeds on us or transact or not transact but trade seeds the main thing is is if we can trade seeds and get that outside of their purview we can have <coughs> events that are specifically oriented around that, which don't require any licensing potentially. Again, we're not lawyers, but yep. these are things we need to pursue and look at. And the the whole thing about the medical 215 thing was we fought continuously to expand the range and realm of what was permissible. So caregivers, whether or not you could have a caregiver was something we had to fight for. Transportation was something we had to fight for. Uh, cooperatives, collectives, delivery would be soon. Yep. Yeah, every one of these things was something that had to be fought for, because two fifteen really just said, "Hey, you can grow some, you can grow cannabis, you can access cannabis, maybe abstractly, and like if you get charged." Criminally, you can defend yourself in court using a medical necessity defense. And so it didn't really, like, it didn't positively affirm and prescribe the range of activities that were allowed and permissible. Right. It instead allowed and created this very vague 
thing and an implicit right therein and let us fight that shit out for the better part of a decade, two decades. Right. And that, and that's why, you know, the, the case law is so important because the, the legislation as it's written uh, and as you mentioned is vague in many different areas. And when it's law, but vague, you, you do oftentimes get a, you know, he said, she said it's interpreted one way from like the enforcement standpoint and one way from the participant standpoint, even though it's the same wording. And until you, one of those two parties actually gets called out on it and has to go to court and that specific worded sentence, you know, like you said, wording in these things are so important. I've seen people get off or go to jail because the placement of a comma, where was the comma in there? Um, but until and, you and, have and that and case law, Siva, like Indica yeah. Sativa comes out of like this very thing, yeah. like yeah, exactly, you know, fucking uh, Richard Schultz, the Harvard ethnobotanist who went to Afghanistan and made the tripartite sort of categorization between Ruderalis Indica and Sativa, was doing that to fucking try and get Brotherhood of Eternal Love and fucking like drug dealers off in the states on a technicality based on the fact that the law said ca- uh, cannabis sativa and if you could prove that it was cannabis indica it's not cannabis sativa so yep. different thing you know different totally different species yep so it's 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 important to have that case law that you could point to that specifically addresses the issue uh but again the the scary part about that is somebody has to be the volunteer to put their freedom online and go to court over it Uh, yes and this brings a good point um and one of the things also i wanted to bring up like historically so a person i mention a lot uh he doesn't get mentioned all that much in the histories of 215 and the medical movement but He's an important figure, and he's near and dear to my heart. Um, his name's Jim Squatter. He, Jim Squatter Blair, James Blair. Uh, he's a wild dude. Um, so I met, like, all these people that I met and, like, grew up around, like, Dr. Frank and Squatter. And, oh, wow. Um, a lot of these folks were heavily involved in the anti-nuclear um like uh, the test site. So in, well, there's a bunch of different things. There were nuclear power plants all over the country and wherever there was a nuclear power plant, a lot of these different activists wanted to shut these power plants down. Um, Rancho Seco out here in the Central Valley. um, There were others in the East Bay. So basically these people were involved in direct action, activism, trying to shut down these different nuclear facilities all around the country. The Nevada test site was one of the epicenters for this. Uh, The Nevada test site is located in the center of Nevada and um, the Western Shoshone people, it's like their indigenous homeland and where they're from and very important to them. And they got basically displaced and moved off of all of the, like Area 51, the test site, all of that are in this massive military complex in the center of uh, Nevada. And so all these different people that I grew up with and that my mom was friends with when I was, you know, today, but like as a kid, um, they were all involved in this and Jim Squatter in particular was like super out there and wild. He had a, a reptile shop in like North uh, Oakland, South Berkeley area in okay. a really rough part of town. <laughs> and I remember going to his like lizard shop and him putting crazy fucking lizards on my head as a kid. And he was, like, totally <laughs> freaked out by these things. And, uh, but he was super cool, but he kept getting robbed. And people kept on like showing up into a spot and robbing him over the years. And so eventually after getting robbed a bunch, uh, like one final time, he was like, fuck it. And he took a trip down to Belize 
and he was down in Belize. And when he was down there, he was like skinny dipping in the river and the community, like the whole community village came to the river at once. And he was like, oh shit, I'm gonna like, you know, not stand here exposing myself to town, just like dip into the water and we'll be all good. He fucking dives into a sandbank. Ooh. Paralyzes himself, severs his Ooh. spinal column. Ooh. He is in the water, paralyzed. The villagers all have to come and gather him out of the water and, you know, take him. He's then Ooh. moved out of this, like, rural small village that he's in and metaflighted back to Miami. A bunch of his Shit. friends from the East Bay... Dr. Frank, people like this, go and meet up with him down in Miami where he's in hospital. He's paralyzed from the neck down. He has no movement. They uh, they brought him herb, and he was smoking from a pipe in the hospital um, in Miami in like 93, 94, some time period like that. Um, and then he... Uh, he, event, he convinced the nurses to administer cannabis to him. So these are like South Florida, like Miami nurses in the early 90s who were like helping a wow. quadriplegic man smoke cannabis after his friends had left him with some stash and gone back to California. And, um, and like Swatter always, like he's like a hardcore, like gruff anarchist dude who comes from like Michigan, Detroit, who was like very, he was not a West Coast, California sort of dude. He, he had a much more working class, like anarchist sensibility than like a hippy dippy sensibility. Right. A little, little more intense. We, t we tend to be laid back out here. At least that's what people from the East Coast, I'm looking at you, Cheddar Bob, tell us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, fully. And so like, he was somebody who thought, you know, he, he was friends with, uh, obviously, Dr. Frank and other people who were already involved in medical marijuana at that point and were already, like, organized and active around that, Dennis Prone, etc. And so he thought they were all a bunch of fucking hippies who were just trying to get weed legal so we could all smoke weed, and he was, like, totally down for that, but he was, like, <laughs> not believing at all any of this nonsense about medical cannabis actually like helping in a like real sense he thought it right. was just fucking pseudoscience right um he regained can like movement in his like extremities so he was able to walk and he was able oh, wow. to move his arms and okay. he was still you know, like the paralysis compromised but... yeah Yes, it's still very serious physical, like, it, it hurt just right. to be him, it hurts, right. but um, he nevertheless regained in, like, a miracle of science, sort of whatever, he was able to regain movement, um, and he attributes it to cannabis, and at the, sort of, like, from that point on, once he... He was like, okay, my bad. You guys were <laughs> my bad. on to something. This isn't just some hippie shit. Like, down for the cause. So Squatter was, and he gets the name because he was, like, involved in squats. He's been okay. involved in, like, the homeless movement for years. Um, East Coast and West Coast. He was in the Tompkins Square riots. Um, they were a very, like, in the late 80s, there were some squat. Basically, they tried to, the New York City police tried to enact a curfew okay. in this park that was adjacent to a massive squat that had been operating for years. Okay. And they brought in a helicopter, and like it was Jeez. like street warfare between this squat and the New York City police, and it was fucking crazy. Um, it's, a, it's an wow. insane story. Um, so he was there for that. He was involved in similar, like, sort of squat stuff on the West Coast as well. But he got very involved in the medical cannabis scene. And he was one of the people, he opened the, I always fuck up the name, it's like CBCB or some shit, the... Uh, CBGB? Cannabis the the punk rock band? 
it was, it was <laughs> no, no, it was fully like the that is not a uh, unintentional association there. Um, okay. But uh, I think it was the Cannabis Buyers Club of Berkeley uh, was what it was called or is called. It still oh, okay, okay, operates. Okay. Um, and so he founded basically one of the earliest clubs in Berkeley and was always pushing just very hard. Like he wanted to do needle exchange. He wanted okay. to do all sorts of harm reduction and social services and create a center that provided services to underserved communities mm -hmm. um, in particular. And so he, um, he was very instrumental in like the East Bay scene um, when Ed Rosenthal got popped uh, by the feds. So uh, Ed Rosenthal and Berkeley came up with a, a unique, or excuse me, Oakland came up with sort of a unique set of uh, regulations or ways of dealing with the whole medical scene where they, um, they deputized people. BPG is fucking epic. Um, the original spot was so great. Um, so they deputized in Oakland, they deputized Ed Rosenthal. And he was That's like great. a deputized like nursery clone operator essentially, and was producing clone stock for a lot of different clubs all throughout the, the Bay Area. And the feds raided him and like, you know, prosecuted him and uh Charles Breyer, Stephen Breyer, the Supreme Court Justice's brother, sat on this case and a whole bunch of other cases um, related to cannabis at the time. And um, in that case, um, Ed Rosenthal ended up being prosecuted and wanted to bring a medical defense. And really one of the key things that they needed to establish in the case was they needed somebody to say, that Ed brought clones to a club. And so they subpoenaed all the different club owners across the area. So the BPG, fucking um, the CBCB, uh, a whole bunch of other clubs. Um, another one got uh, subpoenaed and complied with the subpoena. Squatter did not comply with the subpoena in sort of like in ways that only Squatter could do. Yeah, like <laughs> he fully just fucked with them 100% and made when he finally did end up because he got like contempt and all sorts of things for like avoiding, um, yeah, bench warrants and stuff. Yep, yeah. Um, when he finally did get uh, like pulled into court, he made an absolute fucking scene and it was just like impossible <laughs> to deal with the dude. So, like, oh, no. he was like he fully made it impossible for them. Like he was not going to cooperate. Not only was he not going to cooperate, he was going to make the prosecution's life hell the entire time. And like relished in the fact that he had FBI agents like parked outside of his fucking like apartment. And he wasn't even there. And it's like watching the cops, like watch his place. And it's like, there's a dude who's like fully handicapped. Like a crippled dude who's like spying on the cops, thinking they're spying on <laughs> him, being like, ha, ha, ha. Um, just like, you know, walking that, down the street. That's when so, that's when you go for the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> you put the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> yeah. And so, squatter is somebody who, um, any time the cops would fuck with him, he was like down for that fight and was right. always about escalating. He I know that guy. Like, yeah, so he was like, when, <laughs> like, when the threat was the cops, like, we're going to bring the cops over, I was like, squatter's the first person that came to my mind, because I was like, damn, like, he used to have to, like, jump through hoops to get them to, like, bring the cops in. Like, that was the point. The end game was to get the cops involved, because then you could get some criminal shit going, and or civil lawsuits against the cops because he liked nothing more than suing the cops and fucking with them. And as a person who is, who's, he's technically quadriplegic, like his spinal column is severed, like up in very high vertebrates. And the fact that he's walking is incredible. 
and they put their hands on him, and then it's like, yeah. And so he's not somebody who you can fuck with right. because he is severely disabled, but he doesn't necessarily look as disabled as he is, and so Dangerous. he wants to fuck with the cops and get the cops to end up arresting him putting him in jail, and then suing him. And he was successful in fighting the Emeryville cops and was one of the first people to get his... Uh, he didn't actually get his herb returned back to him because it disappeared from evidence. <laughs> yeah. Um, big rats. I got, got his, big rats over there. <laughs> he, uh, he got his uh, equipment and $15,000 in, like, place of his pounds that they stole and probably you know I, i'd hope they use the same math that they use whenever the news channel says they busted some truck or cargo ship at the port they're like 2.2 million dollars three pounds seized you're like yeah huh yeah yeah, that'd straight be, value. yeah that'd be great if they used the same math hopefully they did probably didn't yeah but that um that was one of the things that like he definitely was about and would like actively pursue in the years that he was he's currently living in um back in michigan area and needs help i mean like dude spent his entire life fighting as like <laughs> being an anarchist like squatter pot activist anti-nuclear activist isn't particularly lucrative particularly when like <laughs> no. he like he is so much the like and like everybody who was doing this to get rich like he was doing this for enrichment in terms of like a broader community social service mutual aid thing he didn't want to personally become a rich person he's somebody who would live as a homeless guy and organizing like homeless people for years and years and wanted not to like lived in lavish luxury he wanted to just make it so that like the junkies in his area weren't all passing around communicable diseases right. and causing problems he wanted to reduce that problem he wanted to make sure that if there were sex workers in the community that they weren't being abused and taken yeah. advantage of yeah. he wanted to make sure that the cannabis consumers and patients and people had the ability to access their medicine in a safe space and thought all of these things could be like combined into a um into a, a old school dispensary and that's what honestly to a certain extent why his his model didn't necessarily make the transition even back in the day but the the club itself is still there but he uh, oh, yeah he had to move on yeah, well, it sounds it sounds like a person who's always going to fight the system, um, regardless, and and kind of do it for everybody's benefit. You know, there there are those those just kind of those warriors out there who, yeah, you know, they'll go out on their shield, they'll they'll stand on the front lines, and they'll they'll do it for everybody else. Because a lot of these people, like you said, underrepresented sectors uh, of society. Um, a lot of people just kind of, you know, like throw them away. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to deal with it. They're freaking people too. And there's problems that go on and there's a lot of social services that need work. And, and you know, just the spread of communicable diseases is a perfect example. Um, you know, we, in you know, I'll just say modern society, uh, we have, we have a lot of ways that we try to prevent things, but we don't always necessarily apply that to like, you know, I, I guess back to the homeless camps here in like Seattle, basic sanitation is such a fucking need. Like we, you know, it's, it's like third world India status in, you know, downtown. Meanwhile, you've got, you know, people at the Hilton having their $200 shrimp cocktails. So somebody, somebody needs to fight for those people. Uh, and he sounds like the person that did it. So, you know, hats off to him, man. Every every world needs those types of people. And they're often underappreciated. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Jim Squatter, uh, he was my... Uh, 
the uh, my inspiration in saying, uh, "Bring on the cops, <laughs> right, dude!" And and so many times that's such a it's such an empty and idle threat. I have probably said more times than I than I can count, and especially later, the more the older I've gotten, every time I'm like skateboarding or I'm doing something, and people are like, "I'm gonna call the cops," I'm like, "Cool, call them." I know you're not going to call them, you know, I just always call their bluff on it. But again, I'm used to dealing with them. I'm good at dealing with them. Uh, I'm here with no record, knock on wood. So evidently my, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, yeah, somehow I've managed as well to avoid, um, I mean, I've had, I've had lots of brush ups, but like, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. nothing, nothing that's, I mean, I've had some crazy shit, like, um, it's really weird when you get pulled over in another state and um, out of nowhere, an unmarked car from a different state shows up. That's, That's scary. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I mean, it does. If I'm trying to extradite you somewhere. Um, so the Obama administration, when I said in around 2010, the Obama administration was doing some fucked up shit. Um, uh, Edward Snowden mm -hmm. helped to uncover how the NSA and like local or, you know, state, excuse me, U.S. federal law enforcement agencies were using <laughs> parallel construction to go after people. And what parallel construction was, was essentially if you were like associated with, they would take information. It could be a license plate. It could be phone numbers. It could be things of this nature. And they would connect you to like within degrees of separation to crimes. And if you were like within two degrees of separation of some crime or shit, they would then start investigating or create ways of investigating you through electronic surveillance and things like this. So I was probably closer than that in terms of relationships with people who were doing shit and drove through Wyoming and got pulled over, had my ID and everything run and announced over the fucking uh you know they run your fucking id on the um on the system and like what ends up the way wyoming hat works wyoming was really fucked up at this time they would pull almost anybody over who was driving with california flights they immediately do a drug interdiction they would start by separating people in the vehicle and questioning them then use any discrepancies in the stories between the two people as probable cause. Right. That's not, you can't do that. It is, you can't use people's, separate people and use their own statements against them to establish probable cause. There was actually precedent that had recently been established when they did that with me. That was one of the reasons the search got thrown out. There were a number of them, um, but they then bring out the dog, do the dog inspection, literally did through a treat, a like dog treat into the vehicle, <laughs> and the dog like jumped into the vehicle. Um, Something he, went, he like, likes in there. <laughs> yeah. And like he, uh, he popped the trunk and let the dog jump into the trunk. Um, and like tore, then he was like, okay, dog signaled for fucking cannabis or for drugs. And, uh, did a like three hour drug interdiction where he's tearing the vehicle apart for like two hours. Wow. And he can't find anything. Um, I put my personal head stash of about a quarter ounce in a trash bag, like in with the trash, like it was in a cup in the bag of trash that was in the trunk. And yeah, yeah. that's how I moved with it across the country yeah. and would like pull it out when we stopped. And, you know, it was Bubba Kush. It was fire. <laughs> um, and so, uh, dude can't find it. He's fucking pulling out the MREs from like the emergency pack and wondering if it's like some sort of drugs. He's pulling out literally like stems of, uh, uh, lavender and shit from like the 
center console and being like, this is drugs. Like, he couldn't find anything. And I'm like, yes, charge me with that. Um, <laughs> out of nowhere, this other cop shows up. And he's from Colorado. He's in an unmarked vehicle. They powwow. And he observes the guy doing his thing. And then after observing him do his thing, which literally was like tearing panels off the door, tearing Jeez. the seats apart, pulling everything out of the car, pulling everything out of every item of luggage. And then he, um, you know, the other guy is like watching the silliness and gets involved and methodically within like 20 or 30 minutes finds the bag in the trash. And like, dude literally goes through everything very systematically. Right. He, I had in my backpack, I had no cell phone, but I happened to have two track phones in boxes <laughs> in my oh, bag. <laughs> and he looks at these, looks at me, puts them back in the bag, zips it up, goes, finds the herb, calls me down, and they give me a ticket and they're like, okay, here you go. And we're sent on our way. Right that as we're like leaving and pulling out, another Wyoming State Patrol and a tow truck pull up. We fucking go like to Cheyenne or whatever, fucking write down all of our experiences, what happened, like point by point. Whenever you deal with fucking cops, do that. Always write down a first hand narrative and it like in like in the moment sort of documentation of what happened. Um Called my mom, talked to her. Her friend in Boulder had some more of that Bubba Kush, so drove to Boulder, got more Bubba Kush, went, drove around Colorado, came back to California. So I fucked that trip back east, figured out how things needed to get dealt with logistically. There is no, when we talk to my fucking lawyer, uh, Robert Moxley, Wyoming lawyer, if you ever have any issues and if Robert Moxley's still fucking. Uh, doing law, 100% go to him, guys at G. Um, he told me it would be $5,000 to, like, deal with this. Um, we ended up getting it dealt with, and he sent me back $1,500 because he didn't use it all in the routine because he was able to deal with it that quickly. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's unheard of. <laughs> That's for sure really and i tried to, i was like dude no like keep it like bro yeah. you said five thousand dollars like it's worth it good. worth it to me yeah. yeah yeah no he was like no i can't like legally i can't i didn't those aren't billable hours so here's okay. your money back and i like uh, that man i like that guy and, and he was like full on this is a fucked up case like he was like this doesn't this is not standard operating procedure for what mm. happens here Okay. The normal thing was I was supposed to be arrested, hauled off, stay in jail for the weekend, get my judge, do all that, car impounded, et cetera, et yep. cetera. That's the standard operating procedure. That's why that other tow truck and the other yeah. uh, cop was showing up. Um, the And she was like, yeah, there was something weird about your case. I don't know who that guy was or why he showed up, but... Like, just first impression. Like, they knew the officer, Officer Dwight, when we just described his behavior and action. The intake at Robert Moxley's office was like, yeah, Officer Dwight, we know him. Wow. And I'm pretty sure his dog got disqualified through this. Because oh, they can only have so many of these false positives and, like, mm -hmm. essentially these cases where they get thrown out because right. the dog's alerting in ways that aren't allowed and either it's a handler error or dog error but basically one of them gets decertified at a certain point for too many fuck ups that's good. um yeah and he was like the fact that they were like yeah we know this guy he's a good um but the yeah the fact that that's how they were doing things back in the day like you could be in a traffic stop and have that guy was a DEA agent or a joint yeah. task force. There's no, yeah. like, if you've got a Colorado <laughs> tagged officer coming in out of state who operates in a completely different MO and supersedes local jurisdiction and essentially allows somebody who's pretty clearly doing some crimer shit to go and do more crimer shit, right. 
the intention is to get the person doing crime or shit when they're actually doing crime or shit, not when they're doing a fucking half an ounce of fucking yeah. Bubba Kush in the fucking trash in the trunk. Like, that's not the fish that they were there to catch. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and that's, you know, not unheard of either for them to let the little person kind of float at the end of the line um, just to see what bigger fish jumps onto them. Um, and that, that kind of goes back to the, the program that you were talking about that Edward Snowden kind of uh, revealed. It's like if I was in the phone book of a person that did these types of stuff, uh, well, now that is enough. That's close enough relation for them to go into my phone book and to run the proximities of, you know, have we ever met? Did we come? How close did we ever come? Who did he come? Did this person come close to you? And then maybe I've never met this person, but you came close to me. Uh, it's, it's an interesting tracking system that the digital... It's funny in the '80s we all rallied, you know, against Big Brother, against Big Brother, fuck Big Brother. The '90s we all invited them into our pocket, and we carry them all around everywhere we go. So uh, yeah, your, your your cell phone is uh, <clears throat> a tool that yeah. is not your best friend. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I track phones long time, <laughs> long time. I, I flip phone burners like yeah. I didn't get a I, okay I got on social media and the internet and like started like coming out in like 2015 like uh, I lived on a dirt road we grew herb like growing up as a kid um in Colorado we had these things uh co-op lines where like essentially everybody in these rural areas went in together and had a, a phone line and so like everybody used the phone like like eight nine houses at the end of the like dirt road would all have the same phone line and so if somebody else was on the phone you just like you know put it down and wait your turn sort of thing mm -hmm. well during the green merchant you know the late 80s early 90s people were on these co-op lines one household may be involved in some sort of drug activity of some sort, or e even if they're not, drugs get mentioned on their phone line, and there are phone taps going on because of suspected drug activity, and the DEA is trying to like cast this massive wide net and catch all these people engaged in drug activity. Well, in our town, one of these co-op lines, everybody got raided because one person said some like drug shit on the fucking phone and so like i just remember growing up where it was like there will be no like <laughs> early on like early early like there will be you will never say anything on the phone because everybody in the like cul-de-sac neighborhood could get raided and arrested and taken down just by like jokes and dumb shit like that and so there was like this very intense don't talk on phones yeah they're surveilling you and so like for me the idea of like posting like i had a friend who had showed me overgrow i went to his house to look at that shit i thought those people were all going to jail yeah i yeah i, I didn't post a picture until long after legalization uh I'm still hesitant these days. I don't post any pictures, but uh, that's just kind of ingrained. But, uh, you know, the, the me of today, uh, the me of 20 years ago would have been calling myself a dumbass for what I do. I mean, obviously, we're sitting here talking about it, but. Oh, sure. I'm like fully like, what the fuck have you just said? <laughs> yeah. But I also recognize statute of limitation in my rights. Look, I, I have never said that. I haven't broken cannabis laws. I've broken cannabis laws, like wantonly, intentionally. Right. For a long well, time. Good, good people break bad laws, right? Exactly. So I'm not like, I've, I've broken those laws and to the extent that any laws that I could be prosecuted for or crimes that I may have committed pursuant to doing cannabis shit, long past statute of limitations and you know that part of that's just because stupid local politics 
Smoke Doctors made me stop doing a lot of cannabis stuff and made me start doing politics and like <laughs> shift things to towards, you know, Maybe. engaging much more on a political level because before 2015 and 16, when, you know, a fire swept through Calaveras County in 2015, okay. burned most of the area where people grow cannabis, at which point the county decided they were going to regulate. Um, okay. Right. Clean slate. <clears throat> yeah. And so it was like literally the same day MRSA, uh, MRSA was the precursor to uh, Prop 64. Same day it passed, the fire swept through one of the main towns in my county. And so that just like changed everything and really forced us to engage on a different level. Like it wasn't regulations and doing this whole thing in legal cannabis wasn't something any of us wanted. It was something that the county was like, well, I mean, there were some folks who wanted it, but like the county decided we're going to regulate. And then people were like, fuck, okay, we need to get organized to make sure that we don't get fucked. And everybody, like, kind of at that point was like, rally around, let's get engaged. And from 15, 16 on, it's been, like, nonstop political engagement with, like, you know, there were a couple years of growing big, big crops and doing commercial scale production for myself and for a number of people out there. But then they banned it. And after the ban happened, if you were engaged politically in like a public like publicly out there saying hey fuck you like right. fuck the band like mm -hmm. you couldn't grow herb you couldn't yeah. be you're a target publicly. yeah and so yeah i had to shut down and do things in yeah yeah well i think i think they got the sharper edge of the sword on that one you know, they shouldn't have messed with you and just let you grow. They'd probably be, they'd still probably be elected officials around <laughs> if that didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think that the world's a better place that, that you were kind of, uh, corralled in, into that option because, uh, you, you've definitely done a lot with the time and with, with your skills and your knowledge. So that's great. That's something that we all are benefiting from and hopefully you know people are going to benefit walk away from this uh episode with a little bit of history of the california the progression and some of the people that were involved and you can look back into these stories and really appreciate the sacrifices that they made and again if you know if we think today you know you being out there is, is kind of putting a target um go back to the days when it was it was really illegal and you were still just as out there as Dennis Perone and, you know, so a lot of these other people were with it. Um, so, yeah, that, yeah. that takes yeah. big cojones. Totally. To I mean, the, like, yeah, the fact, like, Dennis getting raided multiple times, getting shot, and the police officer being like, damn, I didn't kill him is my only <laughs> regret. It's like, that's like... Yeah those were the terms of the engagement and the fact that a lot of these people like we were saying were either dealing with serious you know an aids epidemic going on or returning from vietnam or you know like this the context in which people were having to fight these fights is right. uh, something that we need to remember and not forget and not just like think oh 215 happened or you know i always the george soros thing is so funny and like uh, i'm like he's a very controversial figure and people like to portray him as a boogeyman he's funded lots of bad things he's funded lots of good things but fuck i don't know if he's funded lots of good things i know one good thing he's funded. <laughs> a good thing yeah <laughs> so he funded 215 and you know there are some who have a uh one thing that i think that is most important out of all of this is there are two different ways of seeing how history and like events unfold there's the one interpretation that sees powerful institutions with plans and abilities to enact them, imposing their will and their 
ideas and plans on people. And then there's an interpretation and understanding of history as a much more complex set of events that does include the ability of individuals to come together and create change and affect change from the bottom up, as it were, or from below, without it being imposed from some sort of like conspiratorial entity like George Soros and a bunch of these other entities and like tech had some long-term plan to co-opt and manipulate these like counterculture hippie sort of AIDS gate community like all of this getting like put together as a plan to me seems like insane like that's that's an incredible like it it's a great story it's but a lot like, of organizing yeah like it just, exactly and it, a much more like i don't want to discount the capacity for individuals to get together and affect change anywhere like at any point in history and while there are systems arrayed against us in a whole host of different fashions, we can't see them as totalizing. And we also, you know, looking back on things, even if we do see that power, powerful entities are play some role in some of this, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's part of some greater scheme that, like, we can now, after the fact, see, like, ah, huzzah. <laughs> and then they prop 64 to us and it was all a plan. Like, <laughs> the evil I, I don't empire. Think, yeah, yeah. So I, I, and I just feel like, you know, so much of this history was people really fighting a good fight and doing things strategically in different ways that made it so that we were all able to do something. And even though what happened in California was very specific to California, like, it spread like wildfire across the country and has really changed the right, the amount of freedom individuals have in this country and around the world. All right. And I see, uh, I see a, a quote up here. Uh, Alex Hardy, uh, is in chat here. Evil needs only for good men to stand by and do nothing for it to succeed. Absolutely true. And I'll add to that is all it takes for evil to succeed is for a good person to say it's only business. So keep that in mind. Um, Cause yeah, there, there's a lot of that, a lot of that going on, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see how it shakes out. In, in the meantime, we need to continue to protect ourselves and we need to know our rights because there will be issues like this as we go forward with more and more public events. Um, you know, New York is a state where you can smoke cannabis anywhere you can smoke cigarettes. Um, that's definitely not the case in Washington state where I'm at. Um, the only place you're legally able to really consume is your own house with your windows closed. So <laughs> thing, things will be changing. Um, but that's something that you're going to have to be prepared to answer at some point on some day. And I think the takeaway is, you know, Sun Grown Mids had mentioned, um, if you're a medical patient, have your recommendation uh, in, in some places and in some circumstances like his, where it's obviously a well-documented um, history. You don't necessarily need to have that card carrying on you. Um, but that's if, if, if you do have the card, carry it on you, know your rights, know how to talk to these people. And above all, and this is a lesson that I've learned going, you know, maturing in life. I'll use that word. Aging is another word for it. Um, the calmer and more respectful you can be, the more adamant about your rights you can be. Um, if you're belligerent, your rights tend to uh, erode to match kind of your level of belligerence. So just keep that in mind too. It, it, it's, they're frustrating situations. Uh, sometimes it's like, why am I even fucking dealing with this? But, um, you know, like Trevor said there, cool heads prevail. And uh, that, that probably really helped you in your situation sure. at the Emerald Cup. Yeah, and I also just seen Greg McAllister's comment um, there. Uh, yeah, like also, uh, it's uh, the less you say, the better. Yeah. Don't you don't need to defend what you're doing. You don't need to say a whole lot. You need the less that you say, 
the less they're going to be able to use against you and be concise and clear if you work it out ahead of time so that you have a little you know like you had mm -hmm. mentioned a card that you had from the aclu yep. if you have a just quick little wrap that you can bust off um you know what's good had a really good one where he was just able to spit off his this is thc free cbd hemp smokable hemp i can go and buy this down at the 7-eleven there's no limit on how much i can possess he just like he could snap like spit it off super quick having something like, like that exactly like they they had no response like i just saw her like <laughs> fuck. um so that's that's something to keep in mind there's no need to elaborate you need don't need to say anything beyond that yeah i, w I was growing up taught never to volunteer information because you never know how it's going to be used against you or when it's going to be used against you. So exactly. volunteer information. Yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely, that's something to keep in mind. Do not give them any information. Keep it as brief as possible. Have a pre like written out sort of spiel if you can. And that way you, you know, even if you are, because you are going to be like, it's a nerve wracking mm -hmm. so, circumstance whenever you're dealing with cops um or you know people who are trying to use intimidation to impose their authority on you um just be calm and the more prepared you are the better yep and and at the at the top of the show um you know you were saying uh and and this is something that i should probably go back and add to the notes um you know am i under arrest am i being detained and if i'm not um Maybe if you remember that that particular line and can elaborate one more time on it, because that is that's so true. That's so important. That encapsulates the entire conversation in one or two sentences. It's basically, do I need to stay here? Yeah. OK, why? Or yeah. no, I'm free to go because you don't have a reason for me to stay here. So if you can do the eloquent version of that, it'd be appreciated. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the way I've heard it is, um, am I being detained or am I free to go, is the primary okay. question. It's, okay. no, I do not consent to a search, am I being detained or am I free to go? I would like, if I'm being detained, I would like to have legal representation. Like, those are kind of the three things that you need to say. No, I don't consent to any search and seizure. Am I being detained or am I free to go? If I am being detained, I would like to invoke my right to an attorney. Perfect. And then, you know, hit up a lawyer. Yep. And if you're in Wyoming, call Robert Moxley. Dude's a fucking G. Sounds like it, man. Sounds like it, for real. Put that guy in your Rolodex, because uh, hopefully I'll never need him. But, uh, uh, you know, he's like Ghostbusters, man. Who are you going to call? Moxley! Um, cool. I think I think that would be probably kind of a, a good point to leave it at. Those are some good takeaways for people. I hope people rewind those, you know, the last five minutes at least and, and reiterate that to themselves. Uh, it's like Mike Tyson said in, in boxing and fighting, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, and that's kind of like what it feels like when a cop is all of a sudden in your face or you're surrounded. Um, if you've never been in that situation, it's a little disorienting. So have a plan know your plan, practice your plan. And I, I want to give you uh, Sun Grown Mids uh, a chance to kind of add any final thoughts or notes to it. But man, I absolutely appreciate your time tonight. I appreciate the history and some of the legal uh, struggles that you've illustrated for us that people have gone through in California to pave the way for all of us posting on Instagram and, and feeling okay about it or even showing up to these events. So please, I'd, I'd like to give the flo floor over to you, uh, but do please know I, I sincerely appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, no, this has been great. I appreciate you and everyone Peter, thank you for the for the space and all of this. I'm I'm glad uh, glad we were able to get it considering the uh, the early hang up. So it's it's been a great conversation. I'm glad it's been recorded and uh, mostly I think like two things about this. Well, I feel like there are three things that have changed the world in terms of cannabis, and it's the international seed trade that emerged in the 1980s and 
the like wide scale dissemination of modern hybrids, as it were, the development of the online community and overgrow and all of that and the medical movement, like those three things fundamentally changed the way the world, like the cannabis on the face of this earth and the people who were involved in that, you know, many people in this chat, Greg McAllister's in here. His recent comment, I think is, you know, deserves to be highlighted. The, uh, um, let's get up here. Let's it's see. a banger, uh, that yes. Um, you know, that's exactly what you need to do. Um, be polite <laughs> and invoke your right to a lawyer. Like yep. that is solid advice. He knows what he's talking about. He's been through the ringer with, you know, green merch and all of that. He, if you go back and you read the history and you go through all of it, a lot of people fought a lot of different battles in a lot of different ways and did a lot of different things that made it so that we could do this. And we can't forget that. And Prop 64 and the other sort of regularization sort of packages, taxation and regulation packages that have been passed it's neat it's cool i'm glad people can do rec weed and stuff but i i'm not gonna seed what we've gained and that's that's something i think we all need to do both in terms of like on a knowing the history standpoint and like let's remember this and not forget these stories and not forget these individuals and what they've done and also on a like practical We've still got rights in the state of California. There's still some in Washington, you know, <laughs> severely restricted. And like, you know, it's one of those things. It's just, it blows. History is not a linear progression towards yeah. like some expanding better freedom. Like there's dips and turns and regressions and all kinds of shit. And we need to be ever vigilant and just build the thing that we want to see. Absolutely. And then all those things that you mentioned, too, with like the forums and stuff, that was essentially a gathering of like minded people. And it goes to show that if we can organize, we can work together. Um, change can happen. So I think that's a positive thing to continue to work forward towards. And, you know, this channel, a lot of other channels, a lot of great content creators, um, Keep spreading, keep spreading that word, and certainly don't forget your history. Those who forget it are bound to repeat it. So, yeah, make, make sure you understand that history and, and appreciate the players that came before you. Um, you don't have to. You're not going to get a, you know, a bad grade on your report card. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. So hats, hats off to those people, and I appreciate you bringing up some new names for me uh, that, you know, I'd love to, to look into further, and, and some of the classic people that, you know, many of us that uh, are familiar vaguely with, with at least the movement uh, have, have, have heard those names. Um, one, one last thing I do want to get to uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, I see uh, Peter has posted up here. Um, we're going to have uh, Leighton, Kevin, and Shango talking about Pauline and cannabis as medicine. Uh, and it's going to be a, a, a special uh, episode um, in support of our brother Leighton. So I'll just, I'll just leave it there. And uh, you tune in tomorrow. That'll be on the Future Cannabis Project, 10 a.m. on the East or West Coast. Uh, even no, that'd be later on the East Coast. Okay, so yeah, I got that backwards here. Um, but that is about it. that's about it for us tonight. Um, again, I appreciate everybody in chat. I appreciate your time. Um, I appreciate the input. I hope you guys took a lot away from this show. Uh, but I also see you giving back and putting in on this show. Um, I'm going to go twist the mannequin's nipples here for everybody. I'll do that with the camera off. Uh, as somebody said, that's on my fans only page. So please tune in there for the mannequin nipple twisting later. Um, and that's a way to turn a good show into shit. I will sign out with that. <laughs> but uh, thanks again, Sun Grown Mids and Chat. Much love, guys. We'll catch you next time. Word.